Chapter 30 of Norse Pole Voyages by Zaharia A. Mudge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30 Glaciers. The glacier is one of the wonderful things of the northern regions. We will visit one with Dr. Hayes, and on our return to the vessel, listen to some curious and interesting facts concerning it. Although there was no sunshine at the time of the first glacier excursion, the twilight was long and clear. It was October 21st. The run was made to the foot of the glacier from the vessel with the dogs in 40 minutes. It appeared here as a great ice wall, 100 feet high and a mile broad. The glacier is descending the valley extended in breadth, not quite to the slope of the hills so it left between them and each of its sides a gorge. It is very curious that the ice should not lean against the hills as it slips along, and thus fill up all the valley as water would. Our party first stopped and examined the front face of the glacier. It was nearly perpendicular, but bulging out a little in the middle. It was worn in places by the summer streams which run over it, and marred in other parts, by the fall of great fragments into the valley below. While our visitors were gazing at it, a crystal block came down as an angry hint for them to stand from under. Wisely heeding the warning, they turned up one of the gorges between the glacier side and the hill. Here was rough travelling, and we should think dangerous too. There were strewed along in their path ice fragments from the glacier on one side, and rocks and earth which had slid down the hill on the other. If the glacier was as evil disposed as its children, the icebergs, it might let loose some of its projecting crags on their heads. Finding a favorable place, they began to cut steps in the side of the glacier in order to mount to its surface. Having reached the top, they cautiously walked to the center of the icy stream, drove two stakes on a line in it, and then two halfway between these and the sides of the glacier. They then measured the distance of these stakes from each other, and sighted from their tops fixed objects on the hills. They purposed to come in the spring, and examine the distance apart of the stakes, and sight from them the fixed objects, so as to determine how fast the frozen river was moving down the valley. Having set the stakes, they scampered back to the vessel. After a little rest, another journey to the glacier was made, this time without the dogs, the sledges, having a light outfit, being drawn by the men. These were young Nor, the sailor MacDonald, Mr. Haywood, a landsman from the west, an amateur explorer, the Dane Peterson, and the Eskimo Peter. When they arrived at the gorge, the way was so rough that they were compelled to carry the sledge loads in parcels on their backs. It was rough work, and they sought an early camp, but with the frowning ice cliffs on one side and hill crags on the other, both evil minded in the use of their icy and rocky missiles, and with also the uneven bed of rocks beneath them, no wonder they did not sleep. They were soon astir, pushed farther up the gorge and finding a favorable place, began to cut steps up the glacier. The first one who attempted to mount reached some distance, then slipped, and in sliding down carried with him his companions who were following. And the whole company were promiscuously tumbled into the gorge. The one going ahead had better luck the next trial, carrying a rope by which the sledge was drawn up, and all mounted in safety. They now started off up this ice river towards the great sea of ice from whence it flowed. The surface was at first rough, and of course slightly descending towards its front edge. Dr. Hayes walked in advance of the sledge party, carrying a pole over his head, grasped by both hands, being fearful of the treacherous cracks hidden by their ice. Soon down he went into one, but the pole reached across the chasm and he scrambled out. The depth of the chasm remains a mystery to this day. The ice grew smoother as they proceeded, and they made about five miles, 
pitched their canvas tents, cooked with their lamp a good supper, made coffee, ate and drank like weary men, crept into their four sleeping bags, and slept soundly, though the thermometer was about fifteen degrees below zero. The next day they travelled thirty miles, and Cape Upon, an even plain, where the surface of the ice sea was covered with many feet of snow, the crust of which broke through at every step. This made very hard travelling, yet the following day they tramped twenty-five miles more. Now came the ever-at-hand arctic storm. They camped, but lower and lower fell the temperature, and fiercer and fiercer blew the wind. They could not sleep, so they decided to turn their faces homeward. The frost nipped their fingers and assailed their faces as they hastily packed up and started. They were five thousand feet above the level of the sea, and seventy miles from the coast, and were standing in the midst of a vast icy desert. There was neither mountain nor hill in sight. As in mid-ocean the sailor beholds the sea, bounded only by the sky, so here they beheld only ice, which stretched away to the horizon on every side, truly a sea of ice. Clouds of snow whirled along its surface, at times rising and disappearing in the cold air, or drifted across the face of the setting moon, beautiful clouds of fleecy whiteness to the eye, but burning to the flesh as they pelted the retreating explorers, like the fiery sand clouds of the great Sahara. They scud before the wind, which they dared not for a moment face, nor halted until they had travelled forty miles and descended two thousand feet. They then pitched their tents, the cold and wind having lessened, though yet severe. They arrived at the ship the next evening, not seriously the worse for their daring sea voyage on foot. Having been refreshed by food and rest, no doubt our explorers discussed the great glacier problem, and pleasantly chased away many an hour in talk about what they had seen and what they had read on this interesting subject. We think their conversation included some of the following facts. The ice upon which they had been voyaging is a part of a great ocean of ice, covering the central line of Greenland, from Cape Farwell on the south, to the farthest known northern boundary, a distance of at least 1,200 miles. Instead of being formed of drops of water like more southern oceans, it is made up of crystallized dewdrops and snowflakes, which have been falling for ages, and which in these cold regions have no summer long enough, nor of sufficient heat, to convert them into water again. But if the crystal dews and snows continue to fall for ages and never melt, what prevents them from piling up to the sky and sinking the very continent? The all-wise director of the universe has made a very curious arrangement to prevent such a result. This ice ocean runs off into the sea in great ice rivers, which find their way to the shore on both sides of the continent, just as the water does which falls from the clouds on the top of the Andes of South America. There we see the mighty Amazon, one of its rivers, almost an ocean of itself, as it sweeps along its banks between mountains and through immense forests. Greenland has its Amazons in vastness and grandeur, as well as its smaller rivers and little streams. It has also its lakes and sublime Niagaras, its falls and cascades, but they are ice instead of water. That is all the difference between this arctic circulation and that of warmer regions. But of course this ice is not like that which many of the readers see every winter. It is a half-solid, pasty kind of substance. It holds together, yet slides along from the higher land where it accumulates, filling up the valleys, breaking through the openings in the mountain and hilly ridges, and pouring over the precipices, slowly, silently, but with mighty force, ever pressing onward until it reaches the sea. These ice rivers move very slowly. It will be remembered that Dr. Hayes drove some stakes down in the one he visited in October. In the following July he visited the glacier again, 
and compared the relation of these to the landmarks he had noted. He thus found that this ice river moved over one hundred feet a year. It had come down the valley ten miles. Two more miles would bring it to the sea. Some glacier streams which they visited were yet many miles from the shore, one as far away as sixty miles. The great glacier of Humboldt, farther north, was several times visited by Dr. Kane and parties of his explorers. Its face is a solid, glassy wall, 300 feet above the water level, and in extending from Cape Agassiz, a measured distance north, of 60 miles, and then disappearing in the unknown polar regions. Surely this must be the mouth of the Amazon of glacier rivers." But the history of these rivers does not end when they reach the sea. When their broad and high glassy front touches the water, it does not melt away nor fall to pieces, but goes down to the bottom, and if it be a shallow bay or arm of the sea, pushes the water back and fills up the whole space, it may be for many miles. When it reaches water so deep that more than seven-eighths of its front is below the surface, it begins to feel an upward pressure, just as a piece of wood, when forced below its natural water line, will spring back. So after a while, this upward pressure breaks off the massive front, perhaps miles in extent, and many hundred feet in height. As this is launched into the sea, its thunder crash is heard for miles, and the water boils like a cauldron, while the disengaged mass rolls and plunges until, Finding its equilibrium, it sails away, a majestic iceberg. Hereafter, the snow will at times cover it with a mantle of pure whiteness. The fierce storms will beat upon its defiant brow. The beams of the rising and setting sun will display their sparkling glories on its craggy top, or, falling upon the misty cloud which envelops it, will encircle it with all the varying hues of the rainbow. As it voyages in stately dignity southward, anchored it may be at times for months, it will pass in sullen silence the drear, long, dark arctic night, and emerge into the brief summer, to be enlivened as the home of innumerable sea-fowl, who will rear their young upon its cold breast. Ultimately it will go back to the drops of water from which it came, to make a part of the great ocean, and possibly to sail away in clouds over the frozen regions, and to drop again upon its glassy plain in sparkling crystals. End of chapter 13。Chapter 31 of North Pole Voyages by Zaharia A. Mudge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 31 a strange dream and its fulfillment. The winter was fully settled down upon Port Folk, but the dwellers in the schooner United States knew nothing of the anxieties and suffering from cold and hunger which most of the Arctic voyagers have known. There was one foe, however, which they, in common with all who had gone before them, had to fight, namely, depression of mind produced by the weeks of inactivity and darkness. We have seen how many means were used by earlier as well as later explorers to meet and vanquish this foe. Dr. Hayes availed himself of the hints given by his predecessors and had some devices peculiarly his own. To the school of navigation, dramatic performances and the publishing of a weekly newspaper was added the pleasant stimulus of a celebration of the birthday of every man on board. Such occasions were attended by special dinners, the passing of complimentary notes of invitations to the intended guests, which included all, and by fun-making, at which all laughed as a matter of course. On Sunday all assembled in their clean and best suits. Brief religious service was performed in the presence of all, and the day was spent in reading or conversation, save the performance of the necessary routine work. During the favoring light of the moon, some excursions were attempted. One was made by Professor Sontag 
accompanied by Hans and Jensen, with two dog sledges. The object was to reach the harbour where Dr. Kane's advance had been left, and ascertain, if possible, her fate. He started early in November, but returned in a few days, baffled by the hummocks and wide, intervening, treacherous ice cracks. The party had an encounter with, and captured a bear and her cub. The mother fought with maternal fury for her child, tossed the dogs one after another until some of the stoutest and bravest retired bleeding and yelping from the field, and at times charged upon and scattered the whole pack, while the cub itself behaved bravely in its own defense. When the men came up, they threw in, of course, the fatal odds of rifle balls. Once Hans, his gun having failed to go off, seized an Eskimo lance and ran at the beast. Accepting the challenge of a hand-to-hand -hand fight, she made at him with such spirit that he dropped the lance and ran, and nothing saved the cub from supping on Eskimo meat but two well-directed balls, which whizzed at the right moment from the guns of Sontag and Jensen. The bears made a splendid resistance to the unprovoked attack upon them in the peaceable pursuit of an honest calling, that of getting a living, but were conquered and eaten. Among the sad events of the winter was a fatal disease among the dogs. They all died, but nine, by the middle of December. This was alarming, for upon them depended mainly the spring excursions north poleboard. Such being the situation, Sontag took at this time the surviving dogs, and on a sledge with Hans as a driver, started south in pursuit of Eskimo. If they could be brought with their dogs into the vicinity of the ship and fed, there would be a fair chance of having dog sledges when they were wanted. The nearest known Eskimo family was at Northumberland Island, a hundred miles off, and others were at the south side of Whale Sound, fifty miles farther. Perhaps all had gone to the most distant point. They departed in fine spirits and well equipped. Hans cracked his whip, and the dogs, well fed and eager for a run, caused the sledge to glide over the ice with the velocity of a locomotive. Their companions sent after them a hip-hip hurrah and a tiger. The moon shed her serene light on their path, and all seemed to promise a speedy and successful return. The second night after their departure, the solicitous commander had a strange, disquieting dream. He says in the journal of the following morning, I stood with Sontag far out upon the frozen sea, when suddenly a crash was heard through the darkness, and in an instant a crack opened in the ice between us. It came so suddenly and widened so rapidly that he could not spring over it to where I stood, and he sailed away on the dark waters of a troubled sea. I last saw him standing firmly upon the crystal raft, his erect form cutting sharply against the streak of light which lay upon the distant horizon. Christmas came, and was duly regarded. Stores of nice things, the gifts of friends far away, were brought out from secret corners where they had been hid. The tables were loaded with that which satisfied the appetite and gratified the eye, while the rooms of officers and men blazed with cheerful lights. Outside, a feeble aurora seemed to be trying to exhibit an inspiring illumination which contrasted strongly with its cloudy background. January 1861 came, and half its days passed, yet no tidings came from Sontag. The twilight had returned, and already the coming sun was heralded along the golden horizon. The commander was becoming uneasy concerning the missing ones, and began to devise ways of knowing what has become of them. Mr. Dodge was sent to follow their tracks, which he did as far as Cape Alexander, where he lost them and returned. A party was instantly put in readiness for farther search, and was about to start on the morning of January 27th, when a violent storm arose, detaining it two days. As it was on the instant of starting again, two Eskimo suddenly appeared at the vessel's side. 
one of them was Utinar, who appears so creditably in the narrative of Dr. Hay's boat voyage. They were bearers of sad news. Professor Sontag was dead. Hans was on his way to the vessel with his wife, father and mother, and their son, a lad who was left behind with mother when Hans was first taken on board of the schooner. Some of the dogs had died, and the family were necessarily moving slowly. Two days later Hans came in, with the boy only, having left the dogs and the old people near Cape Alexander, and come on for help. He was very cold and much exhausted, and both were sent below for food, warmth, and rest, before being questioned concerning the disastrous journey. The large sledge, drawn by fresh men, was sent for those left behind. The old people were found coiled up in an excavation made in a snowbank, and the dogs huddled together near them, neither dogs nor Eskimo being able to stir, and so all were bundled in a heap on the sledge and drawn to the schooner. The hardy savages soon revived under the influence of good quarters and good eating, but the dogs, five in number, the remnant of the strong force of thirty-six, lay on the deck unable to stir and not disposed to eat. Hunt's story was this. They made a good run the first day, passing Cape Alexander, and camped in a snow hut on Sunderland Island. The next day they reached an Eskimo settlement, but found its huts forsaken. Resting and eating here, they started for Northumberland Island, and having travelled about five miles, Sontag, becoming chilled, sprang from the sledge and ran ahead of the dogs for warmth by exercise. Hans, having occasion to halt the team to disentangle a trace, fell some distance behind. He was urging forward his team to overtake his master, when he saw him sinking. He had come upon thin ice covering a recently open crack, and had broken through. Hans hastened up and helped him from the water. A light wind was blowing, which disposed Sontag not to attempt to change his wet clothes. The fatal error. They hastened back to the hut in which they had spent the night. At first the professor ran, but after a while jumped on the sledge, and when he reached the hut he was stiff and speechless. Hans lifted him into the hut, drew off his wet clothes, and placed him into his sleeping bag. Having tightly closed the hut, he set the lamp ablaze, and administered to him a portion of brandy from a flask found on the sledge. But the cold had done its fatal work. He remained speechless and unconscious for nearly twenty-four hours, and died. Hans closed up the hut to prevent beasts of prey from disturbing the body, continued south, and on the second night came upon a village where he was rejoiced to find several native families who were living in the midst of abundance. Here Hans rested until two Eskimo boys whom he hired with the Sontag presents could go to Cape York after his wife's parents and their son. They overdrew or starved four of the dogs which were left by the way. The natives whom he found were ready on the moment of his arrival to return to the vessel with him, and Utiniach and his companion were the first to show their good will by starting with Hans on his return. A few weeks later the body of Sontag was brought to the vessel, a neat coffin was made for it, and the whole ship's company followed it, mourning to its last resting place. The burial service was read, and it was carefully secured from molestation. At a later period a mound was raised over it, and a chiseled stone slab, with his name and age, marked the head. August Sontag was only twenty-eight years of age when thus suddenly cut off. His loss to the expedition was very great. Hence parents and brother were added to his own family on deck, and proved to be much more efficient helpers in domestic affairs than Mrs. Hans. The boy was washed and scrubbed and combed by the sailors, with whom he became a great favorite, feeling much the place on board as a pet monkey, and proved to be full as annoying to the old cook, who, in his extreme vexation at this mischievous tricks, threatened to kill him a little. The old folks, getting tired of the close quarters on board, built after a while a snow-hut on the floe, and set up housekeeping for themselves. 
End of chapter 31。Chapter 32 of Norse Pole Voyages by Zaharia A. Munch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 32 The Crowning Sledge Journey. The glorious sun reappeared February 18th, tarrying only a moment, but giving a sure prophecy of a coming to stay. Scarcely less welcome was the appearance soon after of Kalutuna, Tatarat, and Miok, all old acquaintances whom the reader will not fail to recognize. Kalutuna was Angekok and Naligak, priest and chief. His gruff old rival, who advised the starvation policy toward the escaping party in the miserable old hut, had been harpooned in the back and buried alive under a heap of stones. These comers brought the much-desired dogs, and they were followed by other old friends from Northumberland Island with additional dog teams. These natives were treated with consideration. They were made content with abundant food and flattered with presents, all of which told favorably upon the success of the enterprise of the generous donors. In the middle of March, the northward excursions commenced. The first consisted of a party of three, Dr. Hayes and Kalutuna driving a team of six dogs, and Jensen with a sledge of nine. It was to be a trial trip, and the experiment began rather roughly. A few miles only had been made when Jensen, whose team was ahead, broke through the ice, and dogs and man went floundering together into a cold bath. The other team, fortunately, was just at hand, so they were drawn out and all returned to the vessel for a fresh and warm start. The next trial, they were gone four days and traversed the Greenland shore to Cape Agassiz and to the commencement of the Great Glacier. The cold at one time was sixty-eight and a half degrees below zero. Yet the sun's rays, through even such an atmosphere, blistered the skin. The grains of snow became like gravel, and the sledge-runners grated over it as if running on the summer sand of our own seashore. Kalutuna had an ingenious remedy for this. He dissolved snow in his mouth, and pouring the water into his hand, coated the runners with it. It instantly freezing made something like a glass plating for them. Kalutuna was greatly puzzled in attempting to understand why this journey was made, but his perplexity took the form of disgust when the fresh tracks were seen of a bear and cub, and the white chief forbade the chase. He argued in the interest of Dr. Hayes, who might thereby have a new fur coat, pointed to the hungry dogs, and finally pleaded for his own family, who were longing for bear meat, but all in vain. The circumstances had changed since. In the same spot nearly, he had urged the dogs after a bear in spite of Dr. Kane, and thus defeated the purpose of his long trip. On their return, they turned into Van Rensselaer Harbor, the place made so famous by Dr. Kane's expedition. Everything there was changed. Instead of smooth ice, over which Dr. Kane's party came and went so often, there were hummocks piled up everywhere in the wildest confusion. Where the advance was left when her men took a last look at her was an ice pile towering as high as were her mastheads. Old localities were undiscernible from the snow and icy aggressions. A small piece of a deck plank picked up near Butler Island was all that could be found of the advance. The Eskimo told nearly as many diverse stories of her history after the white man left her as there were persons to testify, and some individuals, apparently to increase the chance of saying some item of truth, told many different stories. According to these witnesses, she drifted out to sea and sunk, the most probable statement. She was knocked to pieces so far as possible and carried off by the Eskimo, and she was accidentally set on fire and burned. The graves of Baker and Pierre remained undisturbed, but the beacon built over them was broken down and scattered. The result of this experimental trip was the decision of the commander 
not to attempt to reach the open polar sea by the Greenland shore, but to cross Smith Sound at Cairn Point, a few miles north of the schooner. To this point provisions were immediately carried on the sledges for the summer journey beyond. On the 3rd of April, the grand effort to reach the North Pole commenced. The party consisted of twelve persons, who were early at their assigned positions alongside of the schooner. Jensen was at the head of the line of march, on the sledge Hope, to which were harnessed eight dogs. Nor came next, the whip of the Perseverance, with six dogs. Then came a metallic lifeboat, with which the polar sea was to be navigated, mounted on a sledge and drawn by men, each with shoulder strap and trace. Flags fluttered from boat and sledges, all was enthusiasm, and at the word march the dogs dashed away, the men bent bravely to their earnest work, the swivel on deck thundered its goodbye, and the party were soon far away. The very first day's exposure nearly proved fatal to several of the party. One settled himself down in the snow, muttering, I'm freezing, and would have proved in a half hour his declaration had not two more hardy men taken him in charge. The spirits of the men ran low, and they were two hours in building a snow hut in which to hide from the pitiless wind. A rest at Cairn Point and increased experience gave them more energy and the next snow hut was made in less than one hour. They proved the snow shovel a fine heat generator. On the fifth night out, they were overtaken by a storm and were detained two days in their hut. This was a pit in the snow, eighteen feet long, eight wide and four deep. Across its top were placed the boat oars. Across these the sledge was laid. Over the sledge was thrown the boat's sails, and over the sails snow was shoveled. They crawled into this hut through a hole, which they filled up after them with a block of snow. Over the floor, a leveled snow floor, they spread an India rubber cloth. On this was laid a carpet of buffalo skins, and over this another of equal size. Between these they crept to sleep the outside man of the row having no little difficulty in preventing his companions from pulling the clothes off. The wind without blew its mightiest blow, and piled the snow up over the poor dogs, which were huddled together for mutual warmth, and were kept restless in poking their noses about the drift. The cooks were obliged to call to their help the commander in order to keep the lamp from being puffed out and two hours were consumed in getting a steaming pot of coffee. But after a while the bread and coffee, and dried meat and potato hash, were abundantly and regularly served, and the men contrived to pass in talk and song and sleep the hours of the really dreary imprisonment. Before the storm had fully subsided, the party went on the back track to bring up to this point a part of the provisions they had been obliged to deposit. This done, they put their faces to the opposite or American side of the sound. But the difficulties were truly fearful. The ice, like great boulders, was scattered over the entire surface, now piled in ridges ten, twenty, and even a hundred feet high, and then scattered over a level area with only a narrow and ever-twisting way between them. Over these ridges and the sledges had to be lifted, the load often taken off and carried up in small parcels, and the sledges and boat drawn up and let down again. Frequently in the midst of this toil, a man would fall into a chasm up to his waist. Another would go out of sight in one. These terrible traps were so covered with a crust of snow that they could not be discerned. The boat was, of course, capsized often, and much battered. When a ridge had been scaled, and the party had picked their way for a time through the winding path among the ice boulders, they would come to a sudden, impossible barrier, and be obliged to retrace their steps. A whole day of gigantic exertion, and of many miles of zigzag travel, would sometimes advance them only a rifle shot in a straight line. Of course, it was simply impossible to carry the boat, and it was abandoned. 
They were yet only about thirty miles from Cairn Point, but had traveled perhaps five times that distance. For several days after this, the heroic explorers struggled on. A fresh snow with a half-frozen crust was added to their other obstacles. Hummocks and ridges and pitfalls grew worse and worse. The sledges broke, the limbs of the men were bruised and sprained, their strength exhausted, and at last their spirits failed. They had toiled twenty-five days, advanced halfway across the sound, and brought along about eight hundred pounds of food. On the twenty-eighth of April, the main party were sent homeward. Dr. Hayes, Nor, MacDonald, and Jensen pushed on towards the American shore. Their way was, as one of the party remarked, like a trip through New York over the tops of the houses. They progressed a mile and a half and travelled at least twelve, carrying their provisions over the ground by repeating the journey many times. Such was the daily experience, varied by many exciting incidents. Jensen sprained a leg, which had been once broken. The dogs were savage as the wildest wolves with hunger, though having a fair amount of food. Once Nor, in feeding them, stumbled and fell into the midst of the pack, and would have doubtless been devoured as a generous morsel of food tossed to them, had not MacDonald pounced upon them at the moment with lusty blows from a whipstock. All four of the explorers held out bravely in this fearful strain on mind and body, even young Nor never shrinking from the hardest work, nor the longest continued exertions. On the 11th of May, the party encamped under the shadow of Cape Hawks on Grinnell Land, off the American coast. The distance from Cairn Point in a straight line northwest was 80 miles. They had been traveling 31 days, and made a twisting and clambering route of 500 miles. The travel up the coast had the usual variety of dangers, hairbreadth escapes and exhausting toil. A little flagstaff, planted by Dr. Hayes during the Kane expedition, was found, bravely looking out upon the drear field it was set to designate. But the flag it bore had been blown away. Remains of Eskimo settlements long deserted were found. A raven croaked a welcome to the strangers, or it may be a warning, and followed them several days. On the fourth day up the coast, Jensen, the hardiest of the vessel's company, utterly failed. He had strained his back as well as leg, and groaned with pain. What could be done? The party could not proceed with a sick man, nor would they for a moment think of leaving him alone. So the following course was adopted by the commander. MacDonald was left in the snow hut with Jensen, with five days' food and five dogs, with orders to remain five days, and then, if Hayes and Nor, who were to continue on, had not returned, to make his best way with Jensen back to the vessel. The journey of Dr. Hayes and Nor was continued two full days. On the morning of the third day they had proceeded but a few miles when they came to a stand. They had on their left the abrupt, rocky, ice-covered cliffs of the shore. On their right were high ridges of ice, through which the waters of an open sea broke here and there into bays and inlets which washed the shore. Farther progress north by land or ice was impossible. They climbed a cliff which towered eight hundred feet above the sea, whose dark waters were lost in the distance towards the northeast. North, standing against the sky, was a noble headland, the most northern known land, and only about four hundred and fifty miles from the North Pole. The spot on which our explorers stood was about one degree farther north than that occupied by Morton of Kane's expedition yet on the shore of the same open water. Now, if they only had the boat, they were obliged to leave among the hummocks in Smith's Sound, with the provisions and men they had hoped to bring to this point. How soon would they solve the mystery locked up from the beginning, and in the keeping of his frosty majesty of the pole itself? But alas, there were neither boat nor provisions, 
and the movement of the treacherous flows warned the daring strangers that the bridge of ice over which they had come to this side might soon be torn away and make a return impossible they built a monument of stones raised on it a flag of triumph deposited beneath it a record of their visit placed in a bottle and turned their faces homeward End of chapter 32「Chapter 33 of North Pole Voyages by Zaharia A. Mudge」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 33 – Last Incidents of the Expedition Dr. Hayes and Nor were buffeted by a fierce storm soon after starting. They were over fifty miles from M. Donald and Jensen, only ten of which were traversed before they were obliged to encamp. But the storm howled, and tossed the snow clouds about them, making it impossible to build a snow hut. After a brief halt and feeding the dogs with the last morsel of food which remained, they pushed on. The snow was deep, often nearly burying the dogs as they plunged along. The hummocks and rocks over which they climbed lay across their path, and the wind blew with unabated half fury. Yet they halted not until the remaining forty or more miles were accomplished, and they tumbled into the hut of their companions. The dogs rolled themselves together on the snow the moment they were left, utterly exhausted. The weary men slept a long, sound sleep. When they awoke, a steaming pot of coffee and an abundant breakfast awaited them. They had fasted thirty-four hours and travelled in the last twenty-two over forty miles, which the hammocks and deep snow made equal to double that distance of smooth sledging. The last few miles were made in a state of partial bewilderment, so their final safety was another of their many marked deliverances. The remaining run to the vessel had its daily perils and escapes. As they were approaching the American shore, they stepped across a crack on the ice. They had travelled but a short distance when they perceived that there was an impassable channel between them and the land ice. They ran back to recross the crack, and that had become twenty yards wide. They were, in fact, on an ice raft, and were sweeping helplessly out to sea. They had hardly collected their thoughts after this terrifying surprise, before one of the shore corners of their raft struck a small grounded iceberg, and on this, as on a pivot, the outer edge swung towards the shore, struck its margin, allowed them to scamper off, and then immediately swung again into the open water, and shot out to sea. The poor dogs, being insufficiently fed, and necessarily overworked, now began to fail. Jensen's lameness compelling him to ride increased their burden. One died just before the party left the hummocks, and two soon after. A fourth having failed, the commander, thinking to shorten his misery, shot him. The ball only wounding him, he set up a terrible cry, at which his companions flew at him, tore him in pieces, and almost before his last howl had died away in the dreary waste, they had eaten the flesh from his bones. They arrived at the schooner safely, after two months' absence, during which they had travelled thirteen hundred miles. The commander was cheered to learn that the party who returned under McCormick had reached Port Folk in safety. The whole ship's company were in good health, the vessel was immediately thoroughly examined and put in sailing order. As the summer came on, the birds, the green mosses, hardy little flowers, several species of moss and spiders, and even a yellow-winged butterfly appeared to greet its coming. The open water was daily coming nearer the schooner. While awaiting the loosening of its icy fetters, a boat's crew had an exciting walrus hunt. Dr. Hayes had been on a hilltop, which overlooked the bay, when the hoarse bellowing of a distant walrus saluted his ears. Drifting ice rafts were coming down the sound, on which great numbers of these monsters could be seen. He hurried to the vessel and called for volunteers. Soon a whaleboat was manned, and the men, 
armed with three rifles and a harpoon and line, dragged it to the open water, launched it, and rowed into the midst of the drift ice. The first cake of ice which they approached contained a freight of twenty-four walruses, pretty well covering it. The lubberly, ugly-looking sea-hogs appeared as content as their very distant relatives of our stars, while they huddled together and twisted for the sunniest spot, and bellowed in one another's ears. Our hunters were all eager for the fight as they approached with muffled oars, but on coming near to the flow it was apparent that the hunt was not to be all fun, nor the fighting on one side only. The hides of the monsters looked like an iron plating, and were in fact an inch thick, smooth, hairless, and tough, suggesting a good defensive ability, while their great tusks, projecting from a jaw of elephantine strength, hinted unpleasantly to the invaders that their antagonists were prepared for assault as well as defense. Very likely, if one could have seen at that moment the countenances of our boat's crew, they would have shown more of a wish to be in the vessel's cabin than they would have cared to confess with their lips. But there was no flinching. There were two male walruses in the herd, huge, fierce-looking fellows, which roused up a moment to scan the strangers, and then, giving each other a punch in the face with their tusks, stretched out again upon the ice to sleep. In this walrus party there were, besides the two fathers, mothers with children of various ages, from the little ones of four hundred pounds to the young folks. Of course, they were a loving, happy group. The boat came within a few times its length of the ice raft. Miller, an old whaleman, was in the bow of the boat with a harpoon. Hayes, Nor, and Jensen stood in the stern, with their rifles leveled each at his selected victim, while the oarsmen bent forward to their oars. At the ward, the rifles cracked, and the oarsmen at the same moment shot the boat into the midst of the startled oars. Jensen hit one of the males in the neck, not probably doing him much harm. Hay's ball struck the other bull in the head, at which he roared lustily. Nor killed a baby walrus dead, but he disappeared from the raft with the rest, probably pushed off by his mamma. When the old fellow which was wounded by the commander rolled into the water, Miller planted his harpoon in him with unerring skill, and the line attached spun out over the gunwale with fearful velocity. There were a few moments of suspense, and then up came the herd, a few yards from the boat, the wounded bull with the harpoon among them. They uttered one wild, united shriek, and answering shrieks from thousands of startled walruses, on the walrus-laden ice rafts for miles around, filled the air. It was an agonized cry for help, and the answering cry was, We come. There was a simultaneous splash from the ice rafts, and the hosts, as if by the bugle call, came rushing on, heads erect, and uttering the defiant, Hook, hook, hook! They came directly at the boat, surrounding it, and blackening the waters with their numbers. The wounded bull, attached still to Miller's line, led the attack. The hunters had aroused foemen worthy of their steel, and they must now fight or die. It seemed to be the purpose of the walruses to get their tusks over the side of the boat, and so easily tear it to pieces or sink it, and then, having its audacious crew in the water, make short work of them. As they came on, Miller in the bow pricked them in the face with his lance. The rowers pushed them back with their oars, while Hayes, Jensen, and Nor sent, as fast as they could load and fire, rifle balls crashing through their heads. At one time a huge leader had come within a few feet of the boat. Hayes and Jensen had just fired, and were loading, but Nor was just in time to salute him with a ball. The men were becoming weary, while the walrus assaulting column was constantly supplied with fresh troops. The situation was now critical, when, as if to crush his enemy and end the conflict in victory on his side, a walrus goliath, with tusks three feet long, 
led on a solid column of undismayed warriors. Two guns had just been fired, as before. His terrible weapons were fearfully near the gunwale, when Nor's gun came to the rescue. Its muzzle was so near his open mouth that the ball killed him instantly, and he sunk like lead. This sent consternation through the walrus ranks. They all do at once, and when they came up, they were a considerable distance off, their tails to their foes, and retreating with a wild shriek. The battle was ended, and the saucy explorers were victors. The sea in places was red with blood. The harpooned bull and one other were carried as trophies to the vessel. On the 12th of July, the schooner floated, after an ice imprisonment of ten months. The Eskimo, seeing that the white friends were about to leave them, gathered on the shore in sorrowful interest. They had been the receivers of gifts great in their estimation, and they had rendered the strangers no small favors, especially in the use of their dogs, without which no excursions of importance could have been made. Kalutuna actually wept on parting with Dr. Hayes. He had enjoyed under his patronage the Eskimo paradise, plenty to eat, plenty sleep, no work, no hunt. He spoke feelingly of the fading away of his people. Come back, he said, and save us. Come soon, or we shall be all gone. He had reason to express these fears concerning his people. Since Dr. Kane left, thirty-four had died and there had been in the same time only nineteen births. There seemed to be in all the settlements from Cape York to Etah only a hundred. The explorers bid adieu to Port Folk on the 14th, and sailed away to the west side of Smith Sound, and reached a point about ten miles south of Cape Isabella. The hope was entertained by the commander that he might work his way with the vessel north through the now loosening ice, over which he had just been travelling with sledges, get through even Kennedy Channel, to the open sea on the shore of which he had so lately stood, and then sail away to the North Pole. What a stimulating thought! But he found the schooner ice-battered, and weakened by the nips she had experienced, was unequal to the required fight with the defiant pack which everywhere filled the sound. So the explorers turned homeward, they arrived at Upernavik on the 12th of August, after many exciting incidents, but no accident. Here they learned the startling news of the commencement of the Great Rebellion. During their absence President Lincoln had been inaugurated, the black cloud of war had settled heavily over the whole country, and the bloody battle of Bull Run had been fought. They were now to return home and transfer their interest in fighting ice packs, bergs, and polar bears, to the conflicts of civil war. End of chapter 33of the search for Sir John Franklin, and while learned geographers and practical navigators to the regions of cold were devising new methods of search for him, a young engraver was working out a problem in reference to this great enterprise, peculiarly his own. Without special educational advantages, without the resources of wealth or influential friends, but with the inspiration of one feeling a divine call to the undertaking. He matured his plans and began to publish them abroad. He seems to have at once imparted his own enthusiasm to others. The mayor of his own city, Cincinnati, the governor and senator of his own state, Ohio, the latter, the eminent Salmon P. Chase, late Chief Justice of the United States, became his patrons. Coming east, many of the great and wise men of our large cities gave him an attentive hearing, and not a few encouraged his project. The princely merchant, Henry Grinnell, who had already done so much in the Franklin search, took him at once into kindly sympathy. From New York he went to New London, 
from the old whalemen at least, from individuals of them of marked character and large experience in Arctic navigation, he obtained encouraging words. His plan of search, which thus so readily commended itself, was this. He would go into the region where it was now known that Franklin and some of his men had died. He would live with the Eskimo, learn their language, adopt their habits of life, and thus learn all that they knew of the history of the ill-fated expedition. He assumed that many of its men might yet be alive, and if they were, the natives would know it, know where they were, and could guide him to them. To prepare himself for this work, he became conversant with Arctic literature, learning all that the books on the subject taught. He applied himself closely to the study of the practical science bearing on his enterprise, learning the use of its instruments. He sought interviews and correspondence with returned explorers and whalemen. In fact, his heart was in the work with a downright enthusiasm. The marked features of his plan seemed to be two. It was inexpensive and new. As to the manning of his expedition, he proposed to go alone. As to vessels, he asked none. He only asked to be conveyed to the proposed Eskimo country and to be left with its natives. We might name a third attractive feature of this plan, one which always inspires interest, it was bold, bordering on the audacious. We need hardly say to our readers that the name of this new candidate from Arctic perils and honors was Charles Francis Hall, a name now greatly honored and lamented. Mr. Hall was born in Rochester, New Hampshire, in 1821, where he worked a while at the blacksmith's trade, but left both the trade and his native place in early life for the Queen City of the West. The result of Mr. Hall's enthusiastic appeals was an offer by the firm of Williams and Haven, whale ship owners of New London, to convey him and his outfit in their bark, George Henry, to his point of operations, and if ever desired, to give him the same free passage home in any of their ships. The George Henry was going, of course, after whales, and proposed thus to convey him as an obliging incident of the trip. This proposal was made in the early spring of 1860. On the 29th of May he sailed. His outfit was simple and had the appearance of a private romantic excursion. It consisted of a good-sized staunch whaleboat, built for his special use, a sledge, a few scientific instruments, a rifle, six double-barreled shotguns, a Colt's revolver, and the ammunition supposed to be necessary for a long separation from the source of supply. A start was given him in a small store of provisions. Beyond that, he was to supply himself. A tolerable supply of trinkets was added as a basis of trade with the natives. What funds this miniature exploring expedition required was given largely by Mr. Grinnell. The George Henry was accompanied by a tender, a small schooner named the Rescue, having already an Arctic fame. The officers and crew of both vessels numbered 29, under command of Captain C. O. Buddington. We have spoken of Mr. Hall as the only man of his exhibition. He had, after all, one companion. The previous year Captain Buddington had brought home an Eskimo by the name of Kudlago, who was now returning to his fatherland, and to his wife and children. Upon him Mr. Hall largely depended as an interpreter, a friend, and guide in his work. The run of the George Henry to the Greenland coast was made, with but one marked incident. That was to Mr. Hall a very sad one, giving him the first empathic lesson in the uncertainty of his most carefully devised schemes. It was the death and burial at sea of Kudlago, he had left New London in good health, taken cold in the fogs of Newfoundland, and declined rapidly. He prayed fervently to be permitted to he see his wife and children, only that, and he would die content. He inquired daily, while confined to his berth, if any ice was in sight. His last words were, Teco seco, teco seco, 
Do you see ice? Do you see ice? The Greenland shore was just in sight when he departed, and his home and family were three hundred miles away. The George Henry and her tender the rescue sailed north, along the Greenland coast, as far as Holsteinberg, where Mr. Hall purchased six Eskimo dogs. The vessel then stood southwest across Davis Strait and made, August 8th, a snug harbor, which Mr. Hall called Grinnell Bay, a little north of what is known as Frobisher Strait. Here, Mr. Hall was to land and commence his Eskimo life, alone and far away from a Christian home, while the vessel went about its business capturing whales. His feelings on a voyage are indicated by the following extract from his diary. A good run with a fair breeze yesterday. Approaching the north axis of the earth, I, nearing the goal of my fondest wishes, everything relating to the Arctic zone is deeply interesting to me. I love the snows, the ices, the icebergs, the fauna and the flora of the north. I love the circling sun, the long day, the Arctic night, when the soul can commune with God in silent and reverential awe. I am on a mission of love. I feel to be in the performance of a duty I owe to mankind, myself, and God. Thus feeling I am strong at heart, full of faith, ready to do or die, in the cause I have espoused. How he felt when actually engaged in his mission of love, we shall see. We must not, however, think of Mr. Hall in a region comparable to that which included the winter quarters of Kane and Hayes in the expeditions we have just described. They were at least twelve degrees farther north, Mr. Hall being south of the Arctic Circle, so that his winter nights were shorter and milder. His present field of operation was on the coast visited by the whale ships, and where they at times wintered. Besides, Natives had been for many years in contact with white men, and were in some respect more agreeable companions. He will, therefore, as we follow him, lead us into new scenes of peculiar interest, and show us novel features in the character of the Eskimo. The whale ship Black Eagle, Captain Allen, lay in Grinnell Bay on the arrival of our voyagers, and the captain soon appeared on the deck of the George Henry with several Eskimo. One of these natives, named Ugarng, especially attracted Mr. Hall's attention. He was intelligent, possessing strong lines of character, and a marked physical development. He had spent a year on a visit to the United States. Speaking of New York, he said, with a sailor's emphasis, No good. Too much horse, too much house, too much white people. Woman? Ah, woman great many, good. Ogarng will become a familiar acquaintance. Mr. Hall had been giving special attention on the voyage across Davis Strait to his dogs, and they were now to become a chief dependents. He fed them on capelin or dried fish. One day he called them all around him, each in his assigned place, to receive in turn his fish. Now there was one young, shrewd dog, Barbecock, who had not heard or had never cared to heed the proverb that honesty is the best policy. He said to himself, If I can get two of the fish while the other dogs get but one, it will be a nice thing to do. So taking his place near the head of the row, he was served with his capelin. Then, slipping out, he crowded between the dogs farther down, and with a very innocent look awaited his turn. His master thought this so sharp in young Barbecock that he pretended not to see the trick, and dealed him a fish as if he had received none. On going the round again, his master found him near the head of the row, and then at the foot, so the rogue obtained Benjamin's portion. Seeing his success, he winked his knowing eye, as much as to say, Ain't I the smartest dog in the pack? But Barbecark had entered on a rough road with many turns, as all rogues do. After going round several times, during which the trick was a success, Mr. Hall skipped the trickster altogether. It mattered not what place he crowded into, 
there was no more fish for him. The upshot was that he received many less than did his companions. Never did a dog look more ashamed. From that time he kept his place when fish were distributed. Mr. Hall, making the vessel his home, made frequent visits ashore, and received many Eskimo visitors on board, and was thus becoming acquainted with the people. An early visitor was Hooker Jabin, wife of Kudlago, accompanied by her son. She had learned in her tent that her anxiously awaited husband had been left in the deep sea. She entered the cabin and looked at her husband's white friends, and at the chest which contained his personal goods with deep emotion. But when Captain Buddington opened the chest, the tears flowed freely, and when she, in taking out things, came to those Kudlago had obtained in the States for herself and her little girl, she sat down, buried her face in her hands, and wept with deep grief. She soon after went ashore with her son to weep alone. Another very marked character was Paul Luyer, or, as the white men called him, Blind George. He was now about forty years of age, and had been blind nearly ten years, from the effects of a severe sickness. To this blindness was added domestic sorrow. His wife Nikuja was very kind to him for five years after his loss of sight, sharing their consequent poverty. But Ugarng, who had already several wives, offered her a place in his tent as his household wife, the place of honor in Eskimo esteem. The offer was tempting, for Ugarng was a mighty hunter, and rich at all times in blubber, in furs and skin tents and snow huts. So she left poor George, taking with her their little daughter, called Kukoyer. This child became a pet with Ugarng, as she was with her blind father. End of chapter 34「Chapter 35 of Norse Pole Voyages by Zaharia A. Mudge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 35 A Fearful Storm While the George Henry lay at Grinnell Bay, Mr. Hall talked much with the masters of the whale ships and with the most intelligent of the natives concerning his proposed journey to King William's Land. This was a far-away region, where the remains of the Franklin expedition had been found. He proposed to secure the company of one or more Eskimo and make an attempt to reach it with a dog sledge, and to take up his abode with its natives in search of information of the lost ones. But both his white and Eskimo advisers agreed that it was too late in the season to begin such a journey. Mr. Hall would then take the whaleboat built for him, man it with natives, and make the attempt by water. But this was deemed impracticable until spring. So he decided to make his home on board the vessel so long as she remained on the coast, and pursue his study of the Eskimo language and his survey of the region of country with this home as a base of operations. On his return from one of his inland excursions with Kudlago's son, whom the whites called Captain, he saw his widow, apart from all the people, weeping for her great bereavement. Her son ran to her and tried to comfort her, but she would not be comforted. When Mr. Hall approached, she pointed to the spot where their tent was pitched when Kudlago left for the United States. She also showed him the bones of a whale which he had assisted in capturing. Soon after this, the widow visited the vessel with her daughter, Kimilu, who had been the idol of her father. She looked sad on the mention of her father's name, but childlike, her eyes gleamed with joy on seeing the fine things his chest contained for her. Captain B.'s wife had sent her a pretty red dress, necktie, mittens, belt, and other like valuables of little white girls. But Mr. Hall suggested that Kimilu's introduction to the dress of civilization should be preceded by soap and water. The process of arriving at the little girl through layers of dirt was very slow. When this was done, 
her kind friend Hall took a very coarse comb and commenced combing her hair. This had never been done before, and of course the comb pulled, in spite of the care of the operator, but Kimilu bore it bravely. Her locks were filled with moss, greasy bits of seal, and disgusting reindeer hairs, besides other things both active and numerous. A full hour was spent on the hair, but when the comb went through it easily, then the little girl ran her fingers into it, and braided quickly a tag on each side of her head. She then drew these through brass rings, which Mr. Hall had given her. Her Eskimo fur trousers and coat were thrown off, and the now clean and really beautiful girl put on the red dress. Her happiness would have been complete, had her father been there to share her joy. Mr. Hall's kindly nature led him to study the natives in these incidents, and to record them in his journals. Ugarg was one time in the cabin when Mr. Hall had put a few small balls of mercury on a sheet of white paper. It was a new article to the Eskimo, and he tried to pick it up with his thumb and finger, but it escaped his grasp. His efforts would scatter it over the sheet in small globules, and then, as he lifted the corners of the paper, it would run together, and Ugarg would commence catching it with new vigor. He continued his efforts for a full half hour. Amused at first, but finally losing his temper, he gave it up, exclaiming petulantly that there was an evil spirit in it. Blind George became a constant visitor. At one time Mr. Hall gave him a much-worn coat, showing one of the several holes in it. George immediately took a needle, and bringing his tongue to the aid of his hands, threaded it, and mended all of the rents very neatly. At another time Mr. Hall put into George's hand a piece of steel with a magnet attached. The way the steel flew from his hand to the magnet amazed him. At first he seemed to think it was not really so, but when he clearly felt the steel leap from his fingers, he threw both steel and magnet violently upon the floor. But feeling he was not hurt, and that some little girls laughed at him, he tried it again more deliberately, and was better satisfied. Mr. Hall next gave him a paper of needles, desiring him to bring the magnet near them. He did so, and when the needles flew from his hand by the attraction, he sprung to his feet as if an electric current had touched him, and the needles were scattered in every direction over the floor. He declared that Mr. Hall was an angekok, on the 14th of August, another whaling vessel belonging to the owners of the George Henry arrived at Grinnell Bay. Her name was the Georgiana, Captain Tyson, though there were now four vessels near each other, the Rescue and Black Eagle, besides those just named. There were social, merry times. But Captain Buddington, having built a hut here that some of his men might remain to fish, took his vessels farther south for winter quarters, into a bay separated from Frobisher Bay on the south by only a narrow strip of land. This Mr. Hall named Field Bay. Here, snugly hid in an inlet of its upper waters, the vessels proposed to winter. The Eskimo were not long in finding the new anchorage of the Whites, and in a few days a fleet of kayaks containing seven families appeared. Among them was Kudlago's oldest daughter, now married to a native, the sailors called Johnny Bull. She had not heard of her father's death, and stepped on deck elated at the thought of meeting him. Where is my father? she inquired of Ugarn's wife. When she was tenderly told the sad story of his death, she wept freely. Mr. Hall was at once busy visiting the Tupics, summer tents made of skins, pitched by the natives near the shore. He also rode to the islands in various directions, generally accompanied by one or more Eskimo. On one of these visits to an island, with a boy, he had a narrow escape. After several hours' ramble, they returned to the landing, where they had left their boat fastened to a rock. The tide had risen, and the boat was dancing on the waves out of reach. Here was a fix. They were far away from the vessel. The night, cold and dark, was coming on, and they were without shelter. 
but necessity sharpens one's wits. After some delay and perplexity, Mr. Hall hit upon this plan. He took the sealskin strings from his boots, and the strings by which various scientific instruments were attached to his person, tied them together, and thus made quite a long and strong line. To this he tied a moderate-sized stone. Holding one end of the line in his hand, he tossed the stone into the boat, and gently drew it to him, jumped into it, and was soon at the vessel. If Mr. Hall had not been a green boatman, he would not have fastened his boat below high-water mark when the tide was coming in. He probably did not again. One day the crew of the Henry captured a whale in the bay, and the Eskimo joined with others in towing the monster to the ship. In one of the boats was an Eskimo woman with a babe. She laid her child in the bow of the boat and pulled an oar with the strongest of the white men. Before they reached the vessel, the wind blew a gale, the sea ran high, and at times the spray shot into the air and came down in plentiful showers into the boat. The mother cast anxious glances at her child, and as if it was for its life, rowed with giant strength. At last, the prize was safely moored to the Henry, and the natives were rewarded with generous strips of its black skin, which they ate voraciously, raw and warm, from the animal. They carried portions of it to their tupics on shore for future use. This skin is about three-fourths of an inch thick, and in even Mr. Hall's estimation is good eating when raw, but better soused in vinegar. Soon after this, Captain Tyson brought the Georgiana round into Field Bay, and the crews of the two vessels were often together when a whale made its appearance, a circumstance sometimes the occasion of strife when he is captured. One day Smith, an officer of the Henry, fastened a harpoon in a whale, and was devising means to secure his prey. Captain Tyson, who was near in his boat, killed the monster with his lances, and without a word left Smith to enjoy the pleasure of taking it to his vessel. The generous act was appreciated on board the Henry. On the 26th of December a terrible storm commenced, causing the boats which were cruising for whales to scud home. The three vessels, the Henry, Rescue, and Georgiana, were anchored near each other, and near an island, towards which the wind was blowing. It was about noon when the storm began, and as the day declined the wind increased, bringing on its wings a cloud of snow. When the night came on it was intensely dark, and the waves rose higher and higher, as, driven by the tempest, they rolled swiftly by and dashed upon the rocky shore. The vessels labored heavily in the billows and strained at their anchors, now dipping their bows deep in the water, and rising up the top of the crested wave, and leaping again into the trough of the sea, as if impatient of restraint and eager to rush upon the rocks to their own destruction. The roar of the sea and the howling of the winds through the shrouds were appalling to all on board, while they awaited with breathless interest the integrity of the anchors, on which their lives depended. As the night wore on, the watch on deck, peering through the darkness, saw the dim outlines of the rescue steadily and slowly moving towards the shore. She drags her anchors, were the fearful words which passed in whispers through the George Henry. But all breathed easier to hear the report from the watch soon after, that she had come to a pause nearly abreast of the Henry. About midnight the storm put forth all the fury of its power, and the small anchor of the Georgiana gave way, and the others went ploughing along their ocean beds, and as the vessel neared the island, her destruction and the loss of all on board seemed certain. The endangered craft worried round a point of rocks, pounding against them as she went, and reached smoother and safer waters, where her anchors remained firm. The ghostly-looking forms of her men were soon after seen on the island, to which they had escaped. In the meantime the men on the Henry were in constant fear that their vessel would be dashed upon rocks. Just as the morning was breaking the rescue broke away and went broadside upon the island. 
With a crash, the breakers hurled her against the rocks, and seemed to bury her in their white foam. She was at once a hopeless wreck, but her crew still clung bravely to her. When the morning light had fully come, at the first lull in the storm, while yet the waves rolled with unabated fury, a whaleboat was lowered into the sea from the stern of the Henry, with a strong line attached, and the mate Rogers and a seaman stepped into it. Cautiously and skilfully it was guided to the stern of the rescue. Into it her men were taken, and drawn safely to the Henry. All were saved. A shout of joy mingled with the tumult of the elements. The Henry safely outrode the storm. The Georgiana was not seriously injured, and her men returned to her and sailed away for other winter quarters. The rescue was a complete wreck, and, what was a stunning blow to the enterprise of Mr. Hall, his expedition boat, in which, with an Eskimo crew, he had hoped to reach the far-away land of his lone sojourn and search for the Franklin men, was totally wrecked, too. What now should he do? That was to him the question of questions. One thing he resolved not to do. He would not abandon his mission. Captain Buddington thought at first that he might spare him one of the ship's boats in which to reach King William's land. But on careful inquiry, he found that the only one he could part with was rotten and untrustworthy. So waiting and watching became his present duty. End of chapter 35「Chapter thirty six of North Pole Voyages by Zaharia A. Mudge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty six The Aurora. Mr. Hall had an eye for the beautiful in nature. The Aurora deeply impressed him, inspiring feelings of awe and reverence. It will be noticed that explorers in the low latitude of Frobisher Bay are treated to displays of the Aurora on a scale of magnificence and beauty never seen in the high latitudes of the winter quarters of Dr. Kane and Hayes. Night after night, through the months of October, November, and December, Mr. Hall's sensitive nature was in raptures at the wonderful sights. The heavens were aglow. The forms of brightness and colors of every hue changed with the rapidity of fleecy clouds driven before the wind. Before the mind had comprehended the grandeur of one scene, it had changed into another, of seeming greater beauty, of form, color, and brightness. Thousands of such changes occurred while he gazed. No wonder he exclaims, Who but God could conceive such infinite scenes of glory? Who but God execute them, painting the heavens in such gorgeous display? Again he exclaims, it seemeth to me as if the very doors of heaven have opened to-night. So mighty and beauteous and marvellous were the waves of golden light which swept across the azure deep, breaking forth anon into floods of wondrous glory. God made his wonderful works to be remembered. Mr. Hall had been on deck several times, witnessing the enrapturing display, and had returned into the cabin to go to bed, when the captain shouted down the companionway, "'Come above, Hall, at once. The world is on fire.' Mr. Hall hastened on deck. He says, "'There was no sun, no moon, yet the heavens were flooded with light. Even ordinary print could be read on deck. Yes, flooded with rivers of light, and such light, light all but inconceivable. The golden hues predominated, but in rapid succession prismatic colors leaped forth.' We looked, we saw, and we trembled, for even as we gazed the whole belt of aurora began to be alive with flashes. Then each pile or bank of light became myriads, some now dropping down the great pathway or belt, others springing up, others leaping with lightning flash from one side, while more as quickly passed into the vacated space, some twisting themselves into folds, entwining with others like enormous serpents, and all these movements as quick as the eye could follow. It seemed as though there was a struggle with these heavenly lights to reach and occupy the dome above our heads. 
Then the whole arch above became crowded. Down, down it came. Nearer and nearer it approached us. Sheets of golden flames, coruscating while leaping from the auroral belt, seemed as if met in their course by some mighty agency that turned them into the colors of the rainbow. While the auroral fires seemed to be descending upon us, one of our number exclaimed, Hark! Hark! Such a display, as if a warfare were a going on among the beauteous lights, seemed impossible without noise, but all was silent. After the watchers, amazed at what they saw, retired to the cabin, they very naturally commenced a lively conversation on what they had witnessed. Captain Buddington declared that, though he had spent most of his time for eleven years in the northern regions, he had never witnessed so grand and beautiful a scene. And he added in an earnest tone, To tell you the truth, friend Hall, I do not care to see the like again. In November Mr. Hall became acquainted with two remarkable Eskimo, whom we shall often meet. Their names were Eberbing and his wife Tukulito, but were known among the white people as Joe and Hannah. They had been taken to England in 1853, and lionized there for two years. They had visited the great and good of that land at their homes, and had aptly learned many of the refinements of civilization. Queen Victoria had honored them with an audience, and they had dined with Prince Albert. Joe declared that the Queen was pretty, yes, quite pretty, and the Prince was good, very good. They made their visit on shipboard in a full-blown English dress, but when Mr. Hall returned their visit into their tupic on shore, they were in the Eskimo costume. Yet Tukulito busied herself with her knitting during his call. She said as they conversed, I feel very sorry to say that many of the whaling people are bad, making the Inuits bad too. They swear very much, and make our people swear. I wish they would not do so. Americans swear a great deal, more and worse than the English. I wish no one would swear. It is a very bad practice, I believe. Tukulito's spirit and example had done much to improve her people, especially the women. These, many of them, had adopted her habit of dressing her hair, and of cleanliness of person and abode. In her and her husband, whom we shall meet often, we shall see the Eskimo as modified by a partial Christian civilization. Mr. Hall made frequent visits to the Eskimo village on shore, mingling with the people, conforming to their habits and studying their character. Their summer, skin-covered huts, tupics, had now given way to the igloos, the snow houses, essentially like those we have before seen. We will accompany Mr. Hall in a visit made in October. He found on creeping into a hut a friend, whom he knew as a pilot and boatman. His name was Kujesse. He was sitting in the midst of a group of women drinking with a gusto hot seal blood. Our white visitor joined them and pronounced the dish excellent. On going out, he was met by blind George. Mitter Hall, Mitter Hall, shouted the blind man on hearing Mr. Hall's voice. There was a pensive earnestness in the call which arrested his attention. Ogarn come today, continued George. He come today. My little cuckooyer, way go. She here now. Speak em, Ogarn. My little pickaninny, way go. Speak em. The facts were these. Ogarn, who, as we have stated, had married George's wife, and taken with the mother his little daughter, was at the village attended by the latter. George, who was very fond of the child, desired her company for a while. Mr. Hall did, of course, speak him. Ogarng and the darling Kukoyer were soon seen in happy intimacy with her father. Mr. Hall's attention was attracted by an excited crowd, who were listening to the harangue of a young man. He was evidently master of the situation, for at one moment his audience clenched their fists and raved like madmen, and then... Under another touch of his power, they were calm and thoughtful, or melted to tears. He was an angakuk, and was going through a series of uncootings, or incantations. His howlings and gesticulations were not unlike those of the heathen priests of the East, 
and of the medicine men of our Indians. On seeing Mr. Hall, the Angakuk, left his snow platform, from which he had been speaking, and ran to him with the blondest smiles and honeyed words. He put his arm in his and invited him into his tent, or place of worship, as it might be called. Others ran ahead, and it was well filled with worshippers. Kujasi, who was passing at the time with water for the ship, on a wave of the Angakuk's hand, set his pail down and followed. All faithful Eskimo in this region obey the Angakuk. If he sees one smoking, and signifies that he wishes the pipe, the smoker deposits it in the Angakuk's pocket. When in the tent, the Angakuk placed Kujasi on one side, and Mr. Hall facing him on the other side. Now commenced the service. The Angakuk began a rapid clapping of his hands, lifting them at times above his head, then passing them round in every direction, and thrusting them into the faces of the people, muttering the while wild, incoherent expressions. The clapping of his hands was intermitted by a violent clapping of the chest on which he sat, first on the top, then on the sides and end. At times he would cease, and sit statue-like for some moments, during which the silence of death pervaded the audience. Then the clapping and gesticulations broke forth with increased violence. Now and then he paused, and stared into the farthest recess of the tent, with the fiery eyes and the hideous countenance of a demon. At the right time, to heighten the effect, the wizard, by a quick sign or sharp word, ordered Kujasi to fix his eyes on this point of the tent, then on that, intimating in mysterious undertones that in such places Kudlago's spirit shook the skin covering. Kujasi, though one of the most muscular and intelligent of the natives, obeyed with trembling promptness, while the profuse sweat stood in drops upon his nose. Eskimo perspired freely only on the nose, and his countenance beamed with intense excitement. The climax was at hand. The Angekuk's words began to be plain enough for Mr. Hall's ears. Kudlago's spirit was troubled. Would the white man please give it rest? One of his double-barreled guns would do it. White man, white man, give Kudlago's spirit rest. Give the double-barreled gun. The cunning wizard... But Mr. Hall, who, though brimful of laugh, had been a sober-looking listener, was not to be caught with his chaff, except in his own interest. He whispers to Kujase, Would the Angakok be a good man to go with me in the spring to King William's land? Yes, was the reply. Then Mr. Hall turned to the Angakok and said aloud, If you go with me next spring on my explorations, you shall have one of my best guns. Thinking the gift was to be given immediately, his crafty reverence shouted, thanked Mr. Hall, threw his arms about his neck, and danced with an air of triumph about the tent, seeming to say, as he looked upon his amazed followers, I have charmed a kablunach, white man. Mr. Hall tried to set him right about the terms of the gift, that it was to be when he had served him in the spring, but he would understand it as he would have it. His joy found a fullness of expression when, pointing to his two wives, he said to Mr. Hall, One shall be yours, take your choice. He was disgusted when the white man told him that he had a wife, and that Kabluna wanted but one wife. End of chapter 36《ポール・ヴォイアジス・バイ・ザ・ハリア・エイ・マッジ。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 37 The Dying Eskimo Christmas and New Year's, 1861, were not forgotten as holidays by the sojourners in the regions of cold and ice. Mr. Hall gave his friend Tukulito a Bible as a memento of December 25th. She was much pleased. And at once spelled out the title page, Holy Bible. Mr. Hall, having heard that an Eskimo named Nukerton was seriously sick, invited Tukulito to visit her with him. Sitting down with the sick one, with Tukulito as an interpreter, 
Mr. Hall spoke to her of Jesus and the resurrection, while many of her friends stood listening with intense interest. Tokolito bent over her sick friend weeping, and continued to talk about God, Christ, and heaven, after Mr. Hall had ceased. Mr. Hall visited the sick one daily, administering to her bodily and spiritual wants. Going to see her on the 4th of January, he found that a new snow hut had been built for the dying one, and her female friends had carried her into it, opening to pass her in a hole on the backside. It was at once her dying chamber and her tomb. For this purpose it was built in conformity to the Eskimo usage. He found Nukerton in her new quarters of stainless snow, on a bed of snow covered with skins, happy at the change, though she knew that she had been brought there to die, and to die alone, as was the custom of her people. Mr. Hall proposed to carry her to die on board the ship, but even Tukulito objected to this. It was better she should die alone, such was the custom of their fathers. Mr. Hall remained to watch alone with the dying one, but on his leaving her igloo to do an errand at a neighboring tent, her friends sealed up its entrance. He threw back the blocks of snow piled against it and crept in. Nukerton was not dead, she breathed feebly. The lamp burned dimly, and the cold was intense. The solemn stillness of the midnight hour had come. Sound of footsteps were heard, and a rustling at the entrance. Busy hands were fastening it up, not knowing, perhaps, that Mr. Hall was within. Stop, stop, he shouted, and all was silent as the grave. Come in, he again said. Kudlu, Nakerton's cousin, and a woman came in. They remained a few moments and left. Mr. Hall was alone again, and remained until the spirit of the dying woman departed. He gently closed her eyes, laid out the body as if for Christian burial, closed up the igloo, and departed. Mr. Hall knew cases, later in his stay with this people, in which the dying were for some time alone, before the vital spark was extinguished. The only attendance that the sick have is the howling and mummery of the angecocks, who are sometimes women. They give no medicine. Mr. Hall made several sledge excursions with his Inuit friends. One to Cornelius Grinnell Bay was full of thrilling incidents, of storms, of perils by the breaking up suddenly of the ice on which he had encamped, and one showing the wolfish rapacity of Eskimo dogs. He also had a bear chase and capture. But these, though full of exciting interest, are similar to those of other explorers already related. The Eskimos themselves, with all their knowledge of the ice and storms, have many desperate adventures. A party of them was once busily engaged in sparing walrus, when the flow broke up and they went out to sea, and remained three months on their ice raft. The walrus were plenty, and they had a good time of it, and returned safely. We have given our readers an incident relating to Mr. Hall's dog, Barbecark, a not very creditable incident, it will be remembered, so far as that dog's discernment of moral right is concerned. But then, we must remember that heathen dogs are not supposed to know much in that respect. Barb, as we will call him for shortness, appears again in our story, in a way which shows that he was very knowing about some matters at least. One day, at nine in the morning, a party of the ship's company, attended by the native Kujesi, started for an excursion into Frobisher Bay. When well out of sight of the vessel, a blinding storm arose, making further progress both difficult and dangerous. Kujesi counseled an immediate construction of a snow hut and a halt until the storm subsided, which was the right thing to do. But the white leader ordered a return march. The dogs, as they generally will, with a fierce wind blowing in their face, floundered about in reckless insubordination. Their leader, a strong animal, finally assumed his leadership and dragged them for a while towards some islands just appearing in sight. But Barb, set back in his harness, pricked up his ears and took a deliberate survey of the situation. 
To be sure, he could see only a few rods in any direction, but his mind was made up. He turned his head away from the islands, and drew with such vigor and decision that all, both men and dogs, yielded to his guidance. Through the drifts, and in the face of bewildering clouds of snow, which darkened their path, he brought the party straight to the ship. A few hours more of exposure, and all would have perished. Young Barb was a brave hunter, as well as a skillful guide. On a bright morning in March, the lookout on the deck of the Henry shouted down the gangway that the herd of deer were in sight. Immediately the excitement of men and dogs was at fever heat. The dogs, however, did not get the news until Kujase had crept out, and from behind an island had fired upon the deer. His bow brought down no game, but the report of the gun called out Barb with the whole pack of wolfish dogs at his heels, in full pursuit of the flying, frightened deer. The fugitives made tortuous tracks, darting behind the islands, now this way, and then off in another direction. But Barb struck across their windings along the straight line towards the point at which they were aiming, while the rest of the dogs followed their tracks, and so fell behind. Kujasi returned to the vessel, the hope which just now was indulged of a venison dinner was given up, and the affair was nearly forgotten, except that some anxiety was felt, lest the dogs should come to harm in their long and reckless pursuit. About noon Barb came on board, having his mouth and body besmeared with blood. He ran to this one and then to that, looking beseechingly into their faces, and then running to the gangway stairs, where he stopped and looked back, as much as to say, "'Ain't you coming? Do come. I'll show you something worth seeing.' His strange movements were reported to Mr. Hall in the cabin, but being busy writing, he took no notice of it. One of the men having occasion to go toward the shore, Barb followed him, but finding that he did not go in the right direction, he whined, his disappointment, and started out upon the floe, and then turned and said, as plainly as a dog could speak, Come on, this is the way. A party from the ship determined now to follow. Barb led them a mile northward, then, leaving them to follow his footprints in the snow, he scampered off two miles in a western direction. This brought the men to a near island, under the shelter of which they found the dogs. Barb was sitting at the head of a slaughtered deer, and his companions squatting round as watchful sentinels. The deer's throat had been cut with Barb's teeth, the jugular vein being severed as with a knife. The roots of the tongue, with bits of the windpipe, had been eaten, the blood sipped up, but nothing more. Several crows were pecking away at the carcass unforbidden by Barb, who petted crows as his inferiors. Barb wagged his tail and shook his head as the men came up, and said in expressive dog language, See here, now, didn't I tell you so? The disturbed and blood-stained snow around showed that the deer had fought bravely. One of his legs was somewhat broken in the bloody conflict, which incident might have determined Barb's victory. The men skinned the deer and bore the skin and dissected parts to the vessel. End of chapter 37「Chapter 38 of Norse Pole Voyages by Zaharia A. Mudge」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 38 – Cunning Hunters Our sketch of Mr. Hall's Eskimo life brings us to the early summer of 1861. He had made many excursions in and about Frobisher and Field Bays, which we have not noted, their results were mainly valuable for the relics obtained of the visits here of the famous old explorer Frobisher nearly three hundred years ago. There were, too, he ascertained, traditions among the natives of these visits, as well as that of Perry nearly fifty years before, which so well accorded with the known facts as to show the reliability of such traditions. An incident occurred during one of these excursions which illustrates the deceitful effect of refraction in the northern atmosphere. He landed on a headland in Frobisher Bay 
and secured an enchanting view of land and sea. Points of historic interest were under his eye, and nature was clothed with a wild arctic beauty. But an object of still more thrilling interest comes in view, a steamer. Yes, there is her hull and smoke pipe, all very unmistakable. See, she tacks, now this way, then that, working her way, no doubt, towards the land on which he stands. Mr. Hall ran to the camp and told the good news to Kujasi and Ebirbing, his companions. His mind was fairly bewitched with visions of news from civilization, from his country, and perhaps letters from his dear ones of the family circle. Each shouldered his loaded gun and walked round to the point on the shore towards which the steamer was coming. They would make a loud report with their guns and compel those on board to notice them. When they reached the spot, there was no steamer. The Eskimo looked with blank amazement and turned inquiringly towards Mr. Hall. Had she sailed away? No, that was impossible. It was only that rock yonder half buried in snow. There, it does even now look like a steamer. Wait a while. No, it no more looks like a steamer than it looks like a cow. It is a cruel cell. It will be recollected that the George Henry had made her winter quarters in a little nook in Field Bay, called Rescue Harbor. From the, his home in her cabin, Mr. Hall was going forth on his explorations. But the whalers had made a whaling depot on a cape of Frobisher Bay, which commanded a view of its waters and of the waters of Davis Strait. Here they watched for whales, or made excursions after them. To this depot Mr. Hall made an excursion with Kujasi about the middle of June. On their way over the ice, Kujasi gave illustrations of two Eskimo methods of taking seal that were very peculiar. The dogs scented the seal and broke into a furious run, making the sledge spin over the ice. Soon Kujasi perceived him lying with his head near his hole, on the instant the dogs and their drivers set up a vociferous, startling yell. The seal lifted up his head, frightened almost out of his wits, so that the dogs were within a few rods of him before he so far recovered his senses as to plunge into his hole and escape. Kujasi said that only young seals are so caught. In this case, fright had nearly cost the poor seal his life. At another time Kojase saw a seal sunning himself, and lying, as is their habit, near his hole. The hunter stopped the sledge, took his gun, and keeping back the dogs, lay down, and drew himself along upon his breast, making at the same time a peculiar plaintive sound, varied in intonation. To this seal talk, as the Eskimo term it, the animal listens, and is charmed into a pleasant persuasion that some loving friend is near. He looks, listens, and then lays his head languidly upon the ice. So the wily hunter approaches within easy range, the rifle cracks, and the fatal ball goes through the vitals of the confiding seal. Thus seals, like men, sometimes die of alarm, and are sometimes taken in the flatterer's snare. Mr. Hall found the whale depot a busy place. Numerous tents of the white men and Eskimo were grouped together, in the midst of which, on a substantial flagstaff, the stars and stripes were waving. The Eskimo and dogs proclaimed their welcome in their peculiar way, and the officers and crew made the visitor feel at home. The question soon discussed concerned a boat for Mr. Hall's journey to King William's Land. Captain Buddington said seriously, that the question had been much on his mind, and had been anxiously considered, and his painful conclusion was that he had no whaleboat adequate for the undertaking. The boat made in purpose for that service, which had been lost when the rescue was wrecked, was the only one brought into those waters which could convey him safely. To go in any other would be to throw away his life. So Mr. Hall said heroically, I will make the best of my stay here, in explorations and study of the Eskimo traits and language. Do you return to the States, 
get another suitable boat, and God willing, I will yet go to King William's land. Touching incidents of Inuit life were constantly passing before Mr. Hall. Here is one. There was a young man, Itu, about twenty-five years of age, whom our old acquaintances, Ogarng, had taken into his favor. Itu had the misfortune to be born spotted all over his body, precisely like the snow-white and black spotting of the skin of one species of seal. His heathen parents seemed, on this account, to have loathed their child, for, after enduring his presence a few years in the family, the father carried him to an unfrequented barren island to die. But God, who cared for the child Ishmael and the little Moses, watched over Itu. He caught the sea birds which flocked to the land with his hands, an extraordinary exploit. The summer thus passed, and winter came, and the boy yet lived. It so happened, or shall we not the rather say, God so ordered, that a kayak of natives rode that way. They were surprised when they saw a boy alone on the drear island, and the child was frightened at their presence. But when they made friendly signs, he rushed into their arms. The boy returned to his people, but being shunned and slighted, he became discouraged and indolent. Such was his situation when Ugarng took him into his family. One day Mr. Hall entered the tent of Eberbing and found there a girl, thirteen years of age, Ukudlir, weeping as though her heart would break. She also was of Ogarn's family, but had been staying with the kind Tukulito, wife of Eberbing. Her trouble was that Ugarn was coming to take her away and make her the wife of Itu. Marry a seal-spotted man, the thought was awful. Then she was so young. Eberbing took with him a friend, and called upon Itu and told him the dislike felt toward him of the girl. Poor Itu! Then Tukulito agreed with Ugarng to take charge of Udokler, so the marriage was prevented. Marriage contracts among the Eskimo are made by the parents or other friends, often in the childhood of the parties. Those immediately concerned seldom have anything to do or say in the matter. Among the Eskimo of Whale Sound, the proposed bridegroom was sometimes required to be able to carry off to his igloo, in spite of herself, his intended bride. The resistance in such cases on the part of the woman is supposed to depend upon circumstances. There is no marriage to ceremony. In these Eskimo communities, the two great events, marriage and death, transpire without special note. Among the natives of the region we are now visiting, the newborn child generally first sees the light alone with its mother, and in an igloo built expressly for her. Late in July, the ice broke up and liberated the George Henry from her icy prison. The sailors returned on board, and she sailed away on a whaling cruise. Mr. Hall was left alone with his Inuit friends. He had planned a voyage of exploration in his whaleboat with a crew of them, to be absent about two months. On his return, if he found the whalers in those regions, he would go to the States in one of them. If not, he would remain in Eskimo life until their return. Eberbing and Tukulito were, of course, to be of his party. But Eberbing was taken seriously sick, and so was prevented from accompanying him, much to his regret. His crew, as finally selected, were Kujasi and wife, Charlie, his Eskimo name is too long to write, and his wife, Kudlu, and a widow, Suji, remarkable for her great size and strength, weighing two hundred. The party were off the ninth of August. They passed through Lupton Channel, a narrow run of water connecting Field Bay with Frobisher Bay. A white whale preceded them, leisurely keeping the lead, as if conscious that there were no harpoons in the boat. Perhaps he assumed his safety from the presence of the woman. The seafowl were abundant. The Eskimo, to save ammunition, adopted one of their own amusing yet cruel ways of capturing them. They rowed softly and swiftly to a cluster of them in the water. 
just as the birds were about to fly, the whole crew set up a most terrific yell, at the same time stamping and throwing their arms about with wild gesticulations. Down go the frightened birds, diving instead of flying to escape the enemy. The crew now seize their oars, and the steerer guides the boat by the disturbed surface of the water to the spot where they come up. The moment they show their heads, the uproar is renewed. Down go the birds again without taking breath. This course, though exciting sport to the hunters, is soon death to the poor birds, which, exhausted and finally drowned, are picked from the surface of the water. One of the ducks taken in this way was a mother with a fledgling. As the parent gasped in its dying agony, the child would put its little bill in her mouth for food, and then nestle down under her for protection. The explorers having entered Frobisher Bay, sailed west along its northern shore. They camped at night on the land, and made slow progress by day. The Eskimo were in no hurry, while Mr. Hall would make good time to the extreme west of the bay and survey that line of coast, as the waters had hitherto been deemed a strait. But his three uneasy companions were more disposed to have a good time than to add to geographical knowledge. At one time, Cogesi, taking up Mr. Hall's glass, saw a bear some miles away on an island. Fresh duck was plenty on board, and a chase after Ninu, at the expense of time, was unnecessary. But it would be fun, that settled the matter. Away sped the rickety old whaleboat, impelled by strong hands. Bruin soon snuffed the strangers, stood and looked, then comprehending the danger, turned and ran over to the other side of the island. Soon the boat was in sight of him, and he plunged into the water. The Eskimo now adopted a part of the game they had played so successfully on the ducks. They occasionally made a sudden and deafening uproar. Ninu would stop and turn round to see what was the matter, and so time was gained by his pursuers. But he made good speed for the mainland, and after a while began so far to comprehend the situation that no noise arrested his course. On he went for dear life, the balls soon reached him and dyed his coat in crimson, yet he halted not until one struck his head. This enraged him, he deemed the play decidedly foul. He turned, showed his teeth, and this brought the boat to a standstill. The hunters did not care for a hand to paw or a fight. The rifle settled the unequal conflict, and Ninu's body was towed ashore. The bladder of the bear was inflated, and with some other charms, put on a staff to be elevated on the top of the tupic when the party encamped, and in the bow of the boat when sailing. This ensured good luck, according to Eskimo notions. The explorers were, while in camp at one time, in want of oil for their lamp. Kudlu found some strips of sea blubber, and carried it to Suji, who was in tuktu, that is, in bed. She sat up, rested upon her elbows, put a dish before her, took the blubber, bit off pieces, chewed it, and sucked the oil out, and then spurted it out into the dish. In this way she milled oil enough to fill two large lamps. This done, she lay down again and slept, with unwashed hands and face. There were no white sheets to be soiled. End of chapter 38「Chapter thirty nine of Norse Pole Voyages by Zaharia A. Mudge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty nine Round Frobisher Bay. The explorers found occasionally during their voyage encampments of natives. In these, many incidents occurred illustrating Eskimo habits. At one place, the women were busily employed on sealskins making women's boots. One of them was diligently sewing, while her big boy stood at her breast nursing. Before reaching the head of the bay, Mr. Hall's party was joined by a boatload of Eskimo and several women canoes, 
A beautiful river emptied into the bay here, which abounded with salmon, which proved most excellent eating. Vegetation was abundant. The women brought Mr. Hall a good supply of berries, resembling in size and color blueberries. They were deemed a great luxury. Wolves barked and howled about the camp. The aurora danced and raced across the heavens in strange grandeur. The deer roamed about the rocky coast undisturbed, except by the occasional visits of the Inuits. Mr. Hall, having pretty thoroughly explored the head of the bay, purposed to return on the side opposite that on which he came. Here were hills covered with snow. It had no attractions for his Eskimo companions, and they muttered their discontent at the root. Ascending one of these hills, Mr. Hall planted on it, with much enthusiasm, a flagstaff, from which floated the stripes and stars. On returning to the encampment he found his tent occupied by several Eskimo busily engaged in various items of work. One of the women having done him a favor, he gave her some beads, asking her at the same time what she had done with those he had given her on a former occasion. She said she had given them to the Angekuk for his services in her sickness. Mr. Hall went to a tin box and took out a copy of the Bible and held it up before the woman, saying, This talks to me of heaven. Instantly, as though a light from heaven had flashed upon them all, both men and women left their work and, springing to their feet, looked at Mr. Hall. At first they seemed terrified. Then a smile of joy came over their faces and they said, Tell us what it talks of heaven. As well as he was able, but with a slight knowledge of their language, he unfolded to them the great truths of revelation. When he paused, one of his hearers pointed downward, inquiring if it talked of the grave, or perhaps meaning the place of the wicked. When he answered, yes, they looked at each other with solemnity and surprise. But an incident which occurred soon after showed that these Eskimo did not feel the presence of eternal things. A white whale had been seen and chased by the men and women. He escaped, and the men returned in bad humor. As one of the women was helping to unload the boat, her husband threw a seal hook at her with great force. She parried the blow, and it caught in her jacket. She calmly removed it and continued at her work, as if nothing had happened. Eskimo men are generally the mildest, if not the most affectionate, of savages in their relation to husbands. Yet in their fits of passion they throw anything that is at hand at their wives, a hatchet, stone, knife, or spear, as they would at a dog. At one time the Eskimo men all left Mr. Hall's boat on a hunt. He continued his voyage with the three women rowers. The boat was pleasantly gliding along. When, in passing an island, it fell into a current which rushed over a bed of slightly covered rocks with the rapidity of a mill-race, seething and whirling in its course. The women, though frightened, rowed with great vigor, Suji showing herself more than an ordinary man in the emergency. For some time the struggle was fearful and uncertain. To go with the current was certain death, to get out of it seemed impossible. At last, slowly, steadily, they gained on the rushing current, and then the boat shot into a little cove in tranquil waters. They landed and rested six hours. Mr. Hall had now, September 12th, been out thirty-five days, and he determined to return to Rescue Harbor, hoping to find that the George Henry had returned from her whaling trip. This pleased the Eskimo, but they did not like his south ride route. Kujasi would, in spite of Mr. Hall, steer the boat towards the opposite side, and the rowers enjoyed the joke. At one time our explorer wished to stop and make further examination of a certain locality, but Kujasi was heading the boat northward. His captain urged him to stop, and he replied with savage sharpness, You stop, I go. Even the women rowers, when alone with Mr. Hall, set up an independent authority at one time, and it was only after considerable urging that they yielded to the white man. Once, when Kujese was acting contrary to orders, Mr. Hall turned upon him with tones of authority and a show of determination. He yielded, 
and five minutes afterwards the whole Eskimo crew were as jovial as if nothing had occurred. Yet it was not quite certain that this was a safe course. The life of the lone white man was in their hands. During this voyage Mr. Hall was treated without stint to the delights of one Eskimo practice. We have spoken of the wild songs of their incantations, rising often into a dismal howl. One of the crew of women had a gift in this way, and when she uncooted, the rest accompanied or came in on the chorus. In this way they often made the night of their encampment hideous. One day the boat was gliding smoothly along under the steady strokes of the rowers. The unemployed were nestling down in their furs, dreamily musing, while the dreary expanse of sky and sea was profoundly still, save the distant screech of the sea-fowl and the occasional bark of the seal. Suddenly the female enchanter commenced her mystical song. Her voice was shrill as a night-bird's, and varied by sharp and sudden cracks, like Fourth of July firecrackers. The Eskimo crew came in on the chorus, and the rowers put forth at the same time a frantic energy, their eyes glaring and countenances fearfully distorted. The whole scene was intensely demoniac. The enchanters seemed intoxicated with their howlings, and continued them through the night and most of the two following days. Only one incident more of a noticeable character occurred on this excursion. When one of their nightly encampments had just commenced, a gold fever seized the Eskimo and shook the little community as if they had been white folks. A huge lump of gold had been found. It was precisely the article for which the sovereign of England and her savants had sent here, three hundred years before, the sturdy Frobisher, with a fleet of empty ships. It was emphatically fool's gold. Friday, September 27th, 1861, the explorers arrived at Rescue Harbor. The George Henry was already there. Her energetic officers and crew had toiled through all the season and taken nothing. The explorer and the ship's commander, after a warm supper, sat in the cabin talking over the incidents of their experience, while separated, until a late hour of the night. The whole community were jubilant at their return, as fears were indulged that the crazy craft had sunk with all its occupants. Mr. Hall was not long in finding the tupic of his friends, a beerbing and wife. When the wife of Tukulito saw him, she buried her face in her hands and burst into tears, so great was her joy. While chatting with them, Mr. Hall heard the plaintive sound of an infant voice. Turning back the folds of Tukulito's fur wrapper, a little boy was seen only twenty-four days old, an only child. October twentieth came, and the whalers had secured three whales, an encouraging success after a long failure. But her captain had not intended to stay another winter. His time was out, and so nearly were his provisions. But while Rescue Harbor was yet clear of ice, and he was getting ready to return, purposing to take with him the still enthusiastic explorer, the heavy pack was outside of the harbor in Davis Strait. It had to come, an untimely, unwelcome voyager from the north. While the anxious whalemen were looking for a lead to open and permit them to sail homeward, the frosty king of the north waved his icy skipter, and Davis Strait was as unnavigable as the solid land. Another winter was spent in Rescue Harbor, and it was not until early in August 1862 that the vessel was set free and spread her sails for home. This year, too, was diligently improved by Mr. Hall in explorations and the further study of the Eskimo language and character. He confidently expected to return, after a short stay in the United States, and carry out his proposed plan of explorations in King William's Land. He took home with him Eberbing and Tukulitu, with their infant boy, Tuk Eliketa. The dog Barbekark made one of the returning party. They arrived in New London September 13, 1862, after an absence of two years and three and a half months. End of chapter 39
North Pole Voyages by Zaharia A. Mudge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 40. The Polaris. We have seen that Mr. Hall's enthusiasm for Arctic research was unabated when he returned from his first adventure. In 1864 he was off again. He sailed from New London in the whaler Monticello, accompanied by his Eskimo friends Eberbing and Tukulito. The Monticello entered Hudson Bay, landed the daring explorers on its northern shores, and left them to their fortunes. From thence they made the long, dreary journey to King William's Land, where the relics of Franklin's party had been found, some of whom Hall hoped to find alive. For five years he lived an Eskimo life, experiencing many thrilling adventures, and escaping many imminent dangers. At one time he saved his own life only by shooting an assailant who was leading against him a party who had conspired to murder him. The result of his long sojourn in this region of cold was a store of knowledge of the Eskimo habits and language, but nothing important relating to the fate of the Franklin expedition. Many sad confirmations were indeed found of the fact, before generally accepted, that they had all miserably perished. On his return, Mr. Hall, nothing daunted by hardships and failures, commenced writing and lecturing on the theory of an open polar sea, as he had done before, so now we, he succeeded in impressing not only the popular mind, but scientific men and statesmen, with the plausibility of his theory and the practicability of his plans. Another North Pole expedition was proposed. Congress appropriated to it $50,000, and Mr. Hall was appointed its commander. A craft of about 400 tons, being larger than either of its predecessors on the same errand, was selected, and named the Polaris. She was a screw propeller, and rigged as a four-topsail schooner. Her sides were covered with a six-inch white oak planking, nearly doubling their strength. Her bows were nearly solid white oak, made sharp, and sheathed with iron. One of her boilers was fitted for the use of whale or seal oil, by which steam could be raised if the coal was exhausted. She was supplied with five extraordinary boats. One of these must have been the last Yankee invention in the boat line. It is represented as having a capacity to carry twenty-five men, yet weighing only two hundred and fifty pounds, when not in use it could be folded up and packed snugly away. The Polaris was of course amply equipped and ably manned, and great and useful results were expected from her. President Grant is said to have entered with interest into this enterprise of Captain Hall, and the nation said, God bless him and his perilous undertaking, though many doubted the wisdom of any more Arctic expeditions. A few days before his departure, Mr. Hall received from the hand of his friend, Henry Grinnell, a flag of historic note. It had fluttered in the wind near the South Pole with Lieutenant Wilkes in 1838, had been borne by De Haven far northward. It had gone beyond De Haven's highest in the Cane Voyage, and was planted still farther north poleward by Hayes. I believe, exclaimed Captain Hall, on receiving it, that this flag, in the spring of 1872, will float over a new world, in which the North Pole star is its crowning jewel. The Polaris left New York June 29, 1871, tarried for a few days at New London, and was last heard from as she was ready to steam northward, the last of August, from Tusuysak, the most northern of the Greenland outposts. At this place Captain Hall met our old acquaintance Jensen of the Hayes Expedition. He was flourishing as governor of a few humble huts, occupied by a few humbler people, and he put on consequential airs in the presence of his white brother. He would not be a dog-driver again to an Arctic exploration, not he. Hall says he had a face of brass in charging for his dogs. But the full complement of sixty was made up here, and his stock of furs was increased. 
as our voyagers are now about to enter upon the terribly earnest conflicts of north pole explorers and as their complement of men and women are complete we will further introduce them to our readers the commander hall they know he is well proportioned muscular of medium height quiet but completely enthusiastic in his chosen line of duty believing thoroughly in himself and his enterprise yet believing well too easily of others especially of the rough men of his command some of whom have grown up under the harsh discipline of the whale ship or the naval service the next in command is the sailing master captain s o buddington of our last narrative captain tyson commissioned as assistant navigator to the expedition has been introduced to the reader at frobisher bay while in command there of a whale ship we shall have occasion to become very intimate with him here is our old acquaintance william morton whom we knew so favorably by his heroic deeds in the dr kane expedition he is second mate now of course captain hall's old friends of his first and second arctic experience eberbing and tukulito his wife are here they are now known as joe and hannah and although it does some violence to our taste to drop their eskimo names we will conform to the usage about us and know them in this narrative by these english names they are accompanied by an adopted daughter from among their people about ten years old whom they call puny and here too is our old friend hans taken on board at upernavik having been with kane and hayes nothing daunted by the perils of their voyages he is here to see if possible with hall the north pole though no doubt thinking much more of his twenty-five dollars a month as hunter and dog driver than of the desired discoveries his wife and their three children are with him for like a good husband and father he would not be separated from his family the children are augustina a girl about thirteen years heavy built and most as large as her mother tobias a boy of perhaps eight and a little girl suki of four years think of such a group daring the known and unknown perils of arctic ice and cold with the rest of the ship's company we shall form acquaintance as our narrative progresses on the twenty fourth of august the polaris left to suisak and fairly began her arctic fight in the ice current and wind encounters of melville bay but on she steamed passing in a few days through the bay into the north water into smith sound passing hayes winter quarters yet steaming on by dr kane's winter quarters not even pausing to salute our old friends kalutuna and miok sailing up the west side of kennedy channel the scene of dr hayes conflicts and heroic achievements the polaris finally brings up in the ice barriers of north latitude eighty two degrees and sixteen minutes the highest points of previous voyages in this direction are far south that new world of which the north pole star is the crowning jewel is less than six hundred miles farther if that open sea located in this latitude by confident explorers was only a fact how easily and how soon would the brave polaris be there but the ice flow strong and defiant and the southern current were facts and the open sea nowhere visible the polaris was taken in hand by the ice and current in the historic arctic fashion and set back about fifty miles the ice king had said thus far and no farther and pointed with his frosty fingers southward the polaris early in september was glad to steam in under the land anchor to an iceberg and make her winter quarters captain hall called the harbor thank god harbor and the friendly anchorage providenceburg he had a right here now for a little farther north at a place he called repulse harbor he went ashore threw the stripes and stars to the breeze and took possession of the land in the name of god and the president of the united states we shall not expect to hear that a territorial representative from this land enters the next congress 
if this part of our national domain has a representative in the lifetime of our distinguished acquaintance, Kalutuna, we nominate him for the position as one of the nearest known inhabitants. Now commenced in earnest preparations for an Arctic winter. We have seen how this is done, and Hall and Sam, at least, of his officers, knew how to do it. The hunters were abroad at once, and an early prize was a musk ox, weighing three hundred pounds. His meat was tender and good, having no musky odor. This was but the beginning of the good gunning afforded by this far northern region. Two seals were soon after shot. The country was found to abound in these, and in geese, ducks, rabbits, wolves, foxes, partridges, and bears. The scurvy was not likely to venture near our explorers. A pleasant incident occurred on shipboard about this time, which the reader will better appreciate as our story progresses. It was September 24th. The Sabbath religious service of the preceding day had been conducted by Chaplain Bryant in his usual happy manner. At its close, Commander Hall made some kind, earnest remarks to the men, by which their rough natures were made tender, and they sent a letter from the forecastle to the cabin, expressing to him their thanks. To this he replied in the following note. Sirs, the reception of your letter of thanks to me, of this date, I acknowledge with a heart that deeply feels, and fully appreciates, the kindly feeling that has prompted you to this act. I need not assure you that your commander has, and ever will have, a lively interest in your welfare. You have left your homes, friends, and country. Indeed, you have bid farewell, for a time, to the whole civilized world, for the purpose of aiding me in discovering the mysterious hidden parts of the earth. I therefore must and shall care for you as a prudent father cares for his faithful children. October 10th, after careful preparations, Captain Hall started northward on an experiment in the way of sledging. He purposed more extended sledge journeys in the spring, until the pole itself should be reached. He took two sledges drawn by seven dogs each. Captain Hall and Joe accompanied one, and Mr. Chester the mate and Hans the other. Their experience on this trip was simply of the Arctic kind, of which we have seen so much. Deep snows, treacherous ice, which was in a state of change by the action of winds and currents, intense cold, and vexed and vicious dogs, all put in their appearance. But Captain Hall says, These drawbacks are nothing new to an Arctic traveller. We laugh at them, and plod on determined to execute the service faithfully to the end. The sledge expedition was gone two weeks, and travelled north fifty miles. They discovered a lake and a river. They came to the southern cape of a bay, which they had seen from the Polaris in her drift from above. They named the bay Newman Bay, and attached Senator Summer's name to the cape. From the top of an iceberg they surveyed the bay, and believed it extended inland thirty miles. Crossing the mouth of the bay, they clambered up its high northern cape, which they called Brevurt. Here they looked westward over the waters, up which a good distance passed this point the Polaris had sailed and which they had named Robeson Strait. They peered longingly into the misty distance, and fondly hoped to penetrate it with sledge or steamer in the spring. Joe, the architect of the journey, built here their sixth snow hut. It was warmer than at Thangad Harbour, and birds, musk oxen, foxes and rabbits were seen, and bear and wolf tracks were in the vicinity. Captain Hall was joyous at the future prospect. He wrote a dispatch from this high latitude in which he says, We have all been well up to this time. A copy of it was placed in a copper cylinder and buried under a pile of stones. The party turned their faces homeward. Captain Hall's Arctic explorations were ended. End of chapter 40
Chapter Forty One of North Pole Voyages by Zaharia A. Mudge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Forty One Disaster About noon of October twenty fourth, Captain Hall and his party were seen in the distance approaching the ship. Captain Tyson, the assistant navigator, went out to meet them. Not even a dog had been lost and Captain Hall was jubilant over his trip and the future of the expedition. While he was absent, the work of banking up the Polaris with snow as an increased defense against the cold, the building of a house on shore for the stores, and their removal to it from the ship, had gone forward nearly to completion. He looked at the work, greeted all cheerfully, and entered the cabin. He obtained water and washed and put on clean underclothes. The steward, Mr. Heron, asked him what he would have to eat, expressing at the same time a wish to get him something nice. He thanked him, but said he wanted only a cup of coffee, and complained of the heat of the cabin. He drank a part of the cup of coffee and set it aside. Soon after he complained of sickness at the stomach and threw himself into his berth. Chester, the mate, and Morton, second mate, watched with him all night during which he was at times delirious. It was thought he was partially paralyzed. The surgeon, Dr. Bessel, was in constant attendance, but after temporary improvement he became wildly delirious, imagining someone had poisoned him, and accused first one, then another. He thought he saw blue gas coming from the mouths of persons about him. He refused clean stockings at the hand of Chester, thinking they were poisoned, and he made others taste the food, tendered him, before taking it himself, even that from sealed cans opened in his cabin. During the night of November 7th he was clear in his mind, and as Surgeon Bessel was putting him to bed and tucking him in, he said in his own kind tone, Doctor, you have been very kind to me, and I am obliged to you. Early in the morning of November 8th he died, and with his death, the American North Polar Expedition was ended. The grave of their beloved commander was dug by the men under Captain Tyson, inland, southeast, about a half mile from the Polaris. The frozen ground yielded reluctantly to the picks, and the grave was of necessity very shallow. On the eleventh, a mournful procession moved from the Polaris to the place of burial. Though not quite noon, it was Arctic night. A weird electric light filled the air, through which the stars shone brilliantly. Captain Tyson walked ahead with a lantern, followed by Commander Buddington and his officers, and then by the scientific corps, which included the chaplain, Mr. Bryan. The men followed, drawing the coffin on a sled, one of their number bearing another lantern. The fitting pole thrown over the coffin was the American flag. Following the sled were the Eskimo, last in the procession but not the least in the depths and genuineness of their sorrow. At the grave, Tyson held the light for the chaplain to read the burial service. As the solemn yet comforting words were uttered, I am the resurrection and the life, said the Lord. All were subdued to tears. Only from the spirit of the gospel, breathing its tender influence through these words, was there any cheerful inspiration. The day was cold and dismal, and the wind howled mournfully. Inland over a narrow, snow-covered plain, and in the shadowy distance, were huge masses of slate rock, the ghostly-looking sentinels of the barren land beyond. Seaboard was the extended ice of Polaris Bay, and the intervening shore, strewn with great ice blocks in wild confusion. About five hundred paces away was the little hut called an observatory, and from its flagstaff drooped at half-mast the stars and stripes. Far away were his loved family and friends, whose prayers had followed him during his adventures in the icy north, who even now hoped for his complete success and safe return, and far away at the Christian burial place, where it would have been to them mournfully pleasant to have laid him. But he who had declared that he loved the Arctic regions, and to whose ears there was music in its wailing winds, 
and whose eyes there was beauty in its rugged icy barrenness, had found his earthly resting place, where nature was clothed in its wildest arctic features. A board was erected over his grave, in which was cut. To the memory of C. F. Hall, late commander of the North Polar Expedition, died November 8, 1871, aged 50 years. When the funeral procession had returned to the ship, all moved about in the performance of their duty in gloomy silence. It is sad to record that the great affliction caused by the death of Hall was rendered more intense by the moral condition of the surviving party. Two hideous spectres had early in the expedition made their appearance on board the Polaris. They were the spirits of rum and discord. Commander Hall had forbidden the admission of liquor on shipboard, but it had come with the medicines whether of them or not. It was put under the key of the locker, but it broke out. No, we will not do injustice even to this foulest of demons. An officer, selected to guard the safety and comfort of the ship's company, broke open the locker and let it out. This brought upon him a reprimand from Captain Hall, and later a letter of stricture upon his conduct. The doctor's alcohol could not be safely kept for professional purposes, which raised altercations on board. So rum and discord, always so closely allied, went stalking through the ship, with their horrid train. Insubordination, of course, was from the first in attendance. Hall had, it would seem, in part, persuaded into submission his ghastly spectre, where on shipboard the lives of all depend upon submission to one will, rebellion becomes, in effect, murder. We have seen that Dr. Kane argued down this bloody intruder by a pistol in a steady hand leveled at the head of the chief rebel, and that Dr. Hayes saved his boat party by the same persuasive influence over Kalutuna. But Hall was not reared in the navy, and was cast in a gentle mould. On the Sunday following the burial of Hall, it was announced that from that time the Sunday service would be omitted. Each one can pray for himself just as well, it was remarked. The faithful chaplain, however, seems to have held religious service afterward for such as pleased to attend. Hall had taken great pleasure in it, and it had, we think, attended every Arctic expedition through which we have carried the reader. After such a purpose to dismiss public worship from the vessel, we are not surprised to learn that the men made night hideous by their carousings. Nature without had ceased to distinguish night from day, and our explorers did not follow the example of their predecessors in this region and make day and night below decks by requiring the light to be put out at a stated hour. So the noise and card-playing had all hours for their own, under the circumstances, as if to make the Polaris forecastle the counterpart of one of our city hells, pistols were put into the hands of the men. Discord was now armed, and alcohol was at the chief place of command. The Christmas came, but no religious service with it. New Year's Day brought nothing special. The winter dragged along, but not the wind, which roared in tempests and rushed over the flow in currents travelling fifty-three miles an hour. It played wild and free with the little bark, which had intruded upon its domain, breaking up the ice around it, and straining at its moorings attached to the friendly berg. Spring came at last. Hunting became lively and successful. His Majesty the Bear became meat for the hunters after a plucky fight, in which two dogs had their zeal for bear combat fairly subdued. Musk oxen stood in stupid groups to be shot. White foxes would not be hit at any rate. Birds, trusting to their spread wings, were brought low, plucked and eaten. Seals coming out of their holes and stretching themselves on the ice to enjoy dreamily a little sunshine, to which they innocently thought they had a right as natives of the country were suddenly startled by the crack of the rifles of Hans and Joe, and often under such circumstances died instantly of lead. It seemed hardly fair. In fact, we are confident 
that the animals about Polaris Bay contracted a prejudice against the strangers, except the white foxes who could not see what hurt these hunters did, at least to foxes, and they were of mind that it was decided fun to be hunted by them. The Eskimo have been in this high latitude in the not distant past, as a piece of one of their sledges was found. Soon after Hall's death, the chief officers had mutually pledged in writing that it is our honest intention to honor our flag and to hoist it upon the most northern point of the earth. During the spring and summer, some journeys northward were made, but were not extended beyond regions already visited. The eye which would have even now looked with hope and faith to the region of the star, which is the crowning jewel of the central north, was dim in death. Captain Buddington, now in chief command, had faith and hope in the homeward voyage only. On the 12th of August, 1872, the Polaris was ready, with steam up, for the return trip. On that very day there was added to the family of Hans a son. All agreed to name him Charlie Polaris, thus prettily suggesting the name of the late commander and of the ship. Little Charlie was evidently disgusted with this native country, for he immediately turned his back upon it, the ship steaming away that afternoon. The Polaris had made a tolerably straight course up, but now made a zigzag one back. On she went, steaming, drifting, banging against broken floes, through the waters over which we have voyaged with cane and haze, until they came into the familiar regions of Hayes' winter quarters. On the afternoon of the 15th of October, the wind blew a terrific gale from the northwest. The flow in an angry mood nipped the ship terribly. She groaned and shrieked, in pain but not in terror, for with her white oak coat of mail she still defied her icy foe, now rising out of his grasp, and then falling back and breaking for herself an easier position. The hawsers were attached to the floe, and the men stood waiting for the result of the combat on which their lives depended. At this moment the engineer rushed to the deck with the startling announcement that the Polaris had sprung a leak and that the water was gaining on the pumps. The captain threw up his arms and yelled the order to throw everything on the ice. No examination into the condition of the leak seems to have been made. A panic followed, and overboard went everything in reckless confusion, many valuable articles falling near the vessel, and of course were drawn under by her restless throes and lost. Overboard went boats, provisions, ammunition, men, women, and children. Nobody knew what nor who. It was night, an intensely dark, snowy, tempestuous night. It was in this state of things, when the ship's stores and people were divided between the floe and her deck, that the anchors planted in the floe tore away, and the mooring lines snapped like packthread, and away went the Polaris in the darkness, striking against huge ice cakes, and drifting none knew where. Does God care for sparrows? And will he not surely care for these imperiled explorers, both those in the drifting steamer, and those on the floe, whom he alone can save, and housed in an arctic night, on which no sun will rise for many weeks, exposed to the caprice of winds, currents, and the ever untrustworthy ice raft on which they are cast. We will leave the floe party a while in his care, and follow the fortunes of the brave little vessel and her men. End of chapter 41「Chapter forty two of North Pole Voyages by Zaharia A. Mudge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter forty two The Last of the Polaris. Those left on board of the Polaris were oppressed with fears, both for themselves and those on the floe. The leak in the ship was serious, and the water was gaining in the hold and threatened to reach and put out the fires, and thus render the engine useless. Besides, the deck pumps were frozen up, and only two lower ones could be used. 
but just before it was too late. Hot water was procured from the boiler and poured in buckets full into the deck pumps, and they were thawed out. The men then worked at the pumps with an energy inspired by imminent danger of death. They had already been desperately at work for six unbroken hours, and ere long the fight for life was on the verge of failure. Just then came to the fainting men the shout, Steam's up! and tireless steam came to the rescue of weary muscles. As the dim light of the morning of October 16th dawned on the anxious watchers, they saw that they had been forced by the violent wind out of Baffin Bay into Smith's Sound. Not until now, since the hour of separation, had they counted their divided company. The assistant navigator, the meteorologist, all the Eskimo and six seamen were missing. Part of the dogs had also gone with the flow party. Fourteen men remained, including the commander and the mate, the surgeon and the chaplain. Men were sent to the masthead to look for the missing ones, but the most careful gaze with the best glass failed to discern them. Hope of their safety was inspired by the fact that they had all the boats, even to the little scow, yet it was not certainly known that the boats had not been sunk or drifted off in the darkness, and thus lost to them. So all was tantalizing uncertainty. An examination revealed the encouraging fact that a good supply of fuel and provisions remained on board. A breeze sprang up at noon by whose aid the Polaris was run eastward, through a fortunate lead, as near to the land as possible. Here, lines were carried out on the floe and made fast to the hummocks, all the anchors having been lost. She lay near the shore and grounded at low water. An examination showed that the vessel was so battered and leaky that surprise was excited that she had not gone down before reaching the shore. It was decided at once that she could not be made to float longer. The steam pumps were stopped, the water filled her hold and decided her fate. The sheltered place into which the Polaris had, by divine guidance, entered was Lifeboat Co., only a little north of Etah Bay, every mile of which we have surveyed in former visits. The famous city of Etah, with its two huts, was not far away, but out of it and its vicinity had come timely blessings to other winter-bound explorers. Our party at once commenced to carry ashore the provisions, clothing, ammunition, and all such articles from the vessel as might make them comfortable. The spars, sails, and some of the heavy woodwork of the cabin were used in erecting a house. When done, their building was quite commodious, being twenty-two feet by fourteen. The sails aided in making the roof, which proved to be watertight, and the snow thrown up against the sides made it warm. Within, it was one room for all, and for all purposes. Bunks were made against the sides for each of the fourteen men. A stove with cooking utensils was brought from the ship and set up. Lamps were suspended about the room, and a table with other convenience from the cabin were put in order. But before this was done, a party of Eskimo with five sledges made their appearance. They stopped at a distance and signified their friendly purpose by their customary vile gesticulations and antics. The white men at first took them for the flow party and raised three rousing cheers to welcome. We doubt not, though it is not stated, that they were led on by our special friend Kalutuna. The surly Sipso, it will be remembered, had received what he had sought to give to another, a harpoon planted in the back, and was dead. Though there was left none to rival Kalutunach, Miyuk, the boy that was in Cain's day, was reported as an old man now. Eskimo grow old rapidly. The whole party went to work with a will, having pleasant visions before them, of a new stock of needles, knives, and other white man treasures. They clambered over the hummocky flow, bringing loads of coal from the ship, and with their sleds brought fresh water ice for the melting apparatus. 
several families finally came, built their huts near the vessel, and spent the winter. The shipwrecked whites had nearly worn out their fur suits, and their supply had been greatly reduced by the losses on the flow. So the Eskimo replenished their stock, and their women repaired the worn ones. Thus God makes the humblest and the weakest able at times to render essential help to the strong, and none need be useless. The winter wore off. There was no starvation, nor even short rations. The coal burned cheerfully in the stove until February, and then fuel, torn from the Polaris, supplied its place. The friendly natives brought fresh walrus meat, and scurvy was kept away. For all their valuable services, the Eskimo felt well repaid in the coveted treasures which were given them. The time during the sunless days was passed in reading, writing, amusements, and discussions, according to the taste and inclination of each. Of course, there were some daily domestic duties to be done. The scientific men pursued their inquiries so far as circumstances allowed. The dismal story which has so often pained our ears concerning the Eskimo was true of them generally during the winter. They were suffering with cold and hunger, and three, one of whom was Miyuk, died. The explorers returned the Eskimo kindness by sharing with them, in a measure, their own stock of provisions. The spring came, and with it successful hunting. One deer was shot, and some hares caught. Chester the mate, who seems to have been the Yankee of the party, planned and assisted the carpenter in building two boats. The material was wrenched from the Polaris. They were each twenty-five feet long and five feet wide, square, fore and aft, capable of carrying, equally divided between them, the fourteen men, two months' provisions and other indispensable articles. When these were done, they made a smaller boat and presented it to the Eskimo. It would aid them in getting eggs and young birds about the shore. Clear water did not reach Lifeboat Co. until the last of May. On its appearance in the immediate vicinity, the waiting explorers put everything in readiness for their departure. The boats were laden, and each man assigned his place. Bags were made of the canvas sails in which to carry the provisions. What remained of the Polaris was given to the Eskimo chief, we guess to our friend Kalutuna, as an acknowledgment of favors received. On the 3rd of June, in fine spirits and good health, the explorers launched their boats and sailed southward. At first the boats leaked badly, but they sailed and rowed easily and proved very serviceable. It was continuous day and the weather favorable. Seals could be had for the pains of hunting them, and the sea-fowl were so plenty that ten were at times brought down at a shot. On the downward trip all localities were touched, such as Etah, Haklut Island, and Northumberland Island. The average amount of Arctic storms were encountered. The drift ice behaved in its usual manner, though not as badly as it has been known to do. The little crafts had their hairbreadth escapes, and were battered not a little. Every night, when the toils of the day were over, the boats were drawn upon the floe, everything taken out, and the only hot meal of the day was prepared. Each boat carried pieces of rope from the Polaris and a can of oil. With these, a fire was made in the bottom of an iron pot. Or this fire they made their steaming pots of tea. The party halted a while at Fitzclarence Rock in Booth Bay, about sixteen miles south of the Cape Parry, and within sight of the high, bleak plain, on which Dr. Hayes' boat party spent their fearful winter. On the tenth day of their voyaging they had reached Cape York. In comparison to Dr. Kane's trip over the same waters, theirs was a summer holiday excursion. But Melville Bay was now before them, with its defiant bergs, hummocks, currents, stormy winds, and blinding snows, a horrid crew. No wonder that the fear prevailed among them, that if not rescued they could never reach any settlement. Chester, however, said, we can and will. But the rescuers were not afar off. For another ten days they were made to feel that their battle for life was to be a hard-fought one. 
On the 23rd they saw, away in the distance, what appeared to be a whaler. Could it be? They dared scarcely trust their eyes, for the object was ten miles away. Yes, it was a steamer, and beset too, so she could not get away. New courage was inspired, and they toiled on. But for this timely spur to their zeal, they would have lost heart, for one of the boats in being lifted over the hummocks was badly stow, and their provisions were giving out, though they had calculated that they had two months' supply. Soon after they saw the steamer, they were seen by the watch from the masthead. They were taken for Eskimo, but a sharp lookout was kept upon their movement, which soon showed them to be white men. Signals of recognition were immediately given, and eighteen picked men were sent to their relief. Seeing this, Captain Buddington sent forward two men, and the rescuers soon met and returned with them. With even this addition to their strength, it took six hours to drag the boats, the twelve miles which intervened between them and the whaler. They were received with a kind-hearted welcome by the noble Scotchman, Captain Allen, of the Ravenscraig of Dundee. Their toils were over, and their safety ensured. We will return to those on the flow. End of chapter 42「Norse Pole Voyages by Zaharia A. Mudge」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 43 The Fearful Situation One of the anchors of the Polaris, in starting on the night of the separation, tore off a large piece of the floe with three men upon it. As the Polaris swept past them, they cried out in agony, What shall we do? Captain Buddington shouted back, We can do nothing for you. You have boats and provisions. You must shift for yourselves. This was the last word from the Polaris. Seeing the sad plight of these men, Captain Tyson, who from the first had been upon the floe, took the donkey, a little scow which had been tossed upon the ice, and attempted to rescue them. But the donkey almost at once sunk, and he jumped back upon the floe and launched one of the boats. Some of the other men started in the other boat at the same time, and the three men were soon united to the rest of the flow party. One of the last things Tyson drew out of the way of the vessel as its heel was grinding against the parting flow were some musk ox skins. They lay across a widening crack, and in a moment more would have been sunk in the deep or crushed between colliding hummocks. Rolled up in one of them, and cosily nestling together were two of Hans's children. Does not God care for children? Our darkness and storm beset party did not dare to move about much, for they could not tell the size of the ice on which they stood, nor at what moment they might step off into the surging waters. So they rolled themselves up in the muskox skins and slept. Captain Tyson alone did not lie down, but walked cautiously about during the night. The morning came, and with it a revelation of their surroundings. Huge bergs were in sight which had in the storm and darkness charged upon the flow, and caused the breaking up of the preceding night. It had been a genuine arctic assault. Their own raft was nearly round, and about four miles in circumference, and immovably locked between several grounded bergs. It was snow-covered, and full of hillocks and intervening ponds of water, which the brief summer sun had melted from their sides. Those who had laid down were covered with snow, and looked like little mounds. When the party roused, the first thing they thought of was the ship. But she was nowhere to be seen. A lead opened to the shore inviting their escape to the land. Captain Tyson ordered the men to get the boats in immediate readiness, reminding them of the uncertainty of the continued opening of the water, and of the absolute necessity of instant escape from the flow, in order to regain the ship and save their lives. But the men were in no hurry, and obedience to orders had long been out of their line. They were hungry and tired, and were determined to eat first, 
and they didn't want a cold meal, and so they made tea and chocolate, and cooked canned meat. This done, they must change their wet clothes for dry ones. In the meantime the drifting ice was in a hurry, and had shut up in part the lead. But Tyson was determined to try to reach the shore, though the difficulties had so greatly increased during the delay. The boats were laden and launched, but when they were about halfway to the shore, the lead closed, and they returned to the floe and hauled up the boats. Just then the Polaris was seen under both steam and sail. She was eight or ten miles away, but signals were set to attract her attention, and she was watched with a glass with intense interest, until she disappeared behind an island. Soon after, Captain Tyson sent two men to a distant part of the floe to a house made of poles, which he had erected for the stores, soon after they began to be thrown from the vessel. In going for these poles, the steamer was again seen, apparently fast in the ice behind the island. She could not then come to the floe party, being beset and without boats, and so Tyson ordered the men to get the boats ready for another attempt to reach the land and thus, in time, connect with the vessel. He lightened the boats of all articles not absolutely necessary, that they might be drawn to the water safely and with speed. He then went ahead to find the nearest and best route for embarking. The grounded bergs, in the meanwhile, relaxed their grasp upon the explorer's ice raft, and they began to drift southward. With malicious intent, on came a terrific snowstorm at the same time. Tyson hurried back to hasten up the men. They were in no hurry, but with grumbling and trifling finally made ready, as they pretended one boat, crowded with everything both needful and worthless. When at last it was dragged to the water's edge, it was ascertained that the larger part of the oars and the rudder had been left at the camp far in the rear. In this crippled condition the boat was launched, but not only oars and rudder, but will on the part of the men was wanting. So the boat was drawn upon the floor, and left with all its valuables near the water. The night was approaching, the storm was high, and the men were weary, so no attempt was made to return it to the old camp. All went back to the middle of the floe. Tyson, Mr. Myers, one of the scientific corps, and the Eskimo, made a canvas shelter using the poles of the frame, and the others camped near them. Captain Tyson, after eating a cold supper, rolled himself in a musk-ox skin, and lay down for the first sleep he had sought for forty-eight hours. His condition seemed to be a specially hard one. While, on the night of the great disaster, he was striving to save the general stores, the saving of which proved the salvation of the company, Others were looking after their personal property, so they had their full supply of furs and firearms, while his were left in the ship. He, however, slept soundly until the morning, when he was startled by a shriek from the Eskimo. The flow had played them an arctic trick. It had broken and set the whole party adrift on an ice raft, not more than one hundred and fifty yards square. What remained of their old flow of four miles circumference contained the house made of poles in which remained six bags of bread and the loaded boat in which were the greater part of the valuables here was a fearful state of things yet one boat remained with which they might have gone after the other one but the men seemed infatuated and refused to go away the little raft sailed crumbling as it went assuring its passengers that they must all stow away in their one boat or soon be dropped into the sea. For four days they thus drifted, during which the Eskimo shot several seals. On the 21st, Joe was using the spyglass and suddenly shouted for joy. He had spied the lost boat lodged on a part of the old floe, which had swung against the little raft of our party. He and Captain Tyson, with the dog team, instantly started for it, and after a hard pull, returned with boat and cargo. Soon after, their old flow, in an accommodating mood, thrust itself against the one they were on. The boats were passed over, 
and everything was again together, boats and provisions. Let us now look around upon our party more critically. The whole number was twenty, including the ten weeks old Charlie Polaris, who of course was somebody. As we have stated, all the Eskimo were of this party. Both the cook and steward were here. Much the larger number of the dogs belonging to the expedition were on the floe, but no sledges. Fortunately, in addition to the two boats, one of the kayaks had been saved. It might, in the skillful hands of a Joe, meet some emergency. As there was only faint hope now of again seeing the Polaris, and as their ice boat seemed to sail farther and farther from the shore, they began to make the best winter quarters their circumstances allowed. Under the direction of Joe, an architect and builder, several snow houses were put up. One was occupied by Captain Tyson and Mr. Myers, one by Joe and family, a larger one by the men, and one was used for the provisions, and one for a cookhouse. All these were united by an arched passageway. Hans and family located their house apart from the others, but near. The huts erected, their next pressing need was sledges. The men, with great difficulty, dragged some lumber from the old storehouse, and a passable one was made. Though the quantity of provisions was quite large, yet with nineteen persons to consume it, not to reckon little Charlie's mouth, who looked elsewhere for his supply, and with possibly no addition for six months, it was alarmingly small. Besides, in their unprincipled greed, some of the party broke into the storeroom and took more than a fair allowance. So the party agreed upon two meals a day and a weighed allowance at each meal. It was now the last of October. The sun had ceased to show his pleasant face, and the long night was setting in. To add to their discomfort, the question of light and fuel assumed a serious aspect. The men either from want of skill or patience, or both, did not succeed well in using seal fat for these purposes in the Eskimo fashion. So they began, with a reckless disregard to their future safety, to break up and burn one of the boats. Hans, with a true Eskimo instinct, when the short allowance pinched him, began to kill and eat the dogs. He might be excused, however, Four children, with their faces growing haggard, looked to him for food. Thus situated, our flow party drifted far away from the land, drifting on and on, whether they slept or woke, drifting they knew not to what end. End of chapter 43《ポール・ヴォイアジュス・ベザハリア・エイ・マッジ》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 44 The Wonderful Drift Early in November, Captain Tyson saw, through his glass, about twelve miles off to the southeast, the Kerry Islands. So they were in the north water of Baffin Bay and southwest from Cape Parry, where we have been so many times. From this cape, or a little south of it, it would not be a great sledge trip to where they last saw the Polaris, and where they had reason to think she now was. So our party made one more effort to reach the shore. The boats being in readiness the night before, they started early in the morning. Of course, their day was now only a noon twilight, and the morning was most midday. But the flow was not in a favoring mood. The hummocks were as hard in their usage of the boats and men as usual. The deceitful cracks in the ice at one time put the lives of the dogs and men in great peril, and, as if these obstacles were not enough, a storm brought up its forces against them. They had dragged the boats halfway to the shore when they retreated before superior forces. Their huts being of perishable material were reconstructed. A little later the men built a large snow hut as a reserve. All were weak through insufficient food. Mr. Myers was nearly prostrate and went to live with the men.
Captain Tyson, whose scanty clothing added to care and short rations, caused him to suffer much, took up his quarters with Joe and Hannah and their little puny. Not the least of the trial in the Eskimo huts were the piteous cries of the children for food. Joe and Hans were out with their guns every day during the three hours' twilight, hunting seals. The first one captured was shot by Joe, November 6. Nearly two weeks passed before any further success attended the hunters. Then several were shot, and Captain Tyson, who was ready to perish, had one full meal, a meal of uncooked seal meat, skin hair and all, washed down with seal blood. Some others had not been so long without a full meal, as the bread continued to be stolen. The home Thanksgiving day came. A little extra amount of the canned meat was allowed each one, and all had a taste of mock turtle soup and canned green corn kept for this occasion, to which was added a few pieces of dried apple. How far it all fell short of the home feast may be judged by the fact that Captain Tyson, to satisfy the fierce hunger which remained after dinner, finished with eating strips of frozen seal's entrails, and lastly seal-skin, hair and all. The hunters had seen tracks of bears, so they were on the lookout for them while they hunted seal. One day Joe and Hans went out as usual with their guns. They lost sight of each other and of the camp. Joe returned quite late, expecting to find Hans already in his hut. When he learned that he had not returned, he, as well as others, felt concerned about him. Accompanied by one of the men, he went in search of him. As the two, guns in hand, were stumbling over the hummocks, they saw in the very dim twilight, as they thought, a bear. Their guns were instantly leveled and brought to the sight, and their mouths almost tasted a bear meat supper. Hold on there, that's not a bear. What is it? Why, it's Hans. Well, he did look in the darkness like a bear, and in his shaggy coat he clambered on all fours over the icy hills. December came in with its continuous night. Seals could not be successfully hunted in the darkness, and where seals could not be seen, bears would not make their appearance. The rations became smaller than ever, and ghastly, horrid starvation seemed encamped among our drifting, forlorn party. Under these circumstances, a spectre even worse than starvation appeared to Joe. To him, at least, it was a terrifying reality. It was the demon form of cannibalism. He had looked into the eyes of the men in the big hut, and they spoke to him of an intention to save themselves by first killing and eating Hans and family, and then taking him and his. He and Hannah were greatly terrified, and he handed his pistol to Captain Tyson, which he was not willing to part with before. He was assured that the least child should not be touched for so horrid a purpose without such a defense as the pistol could give. Christmas came. The last ham had been kept for this occasion, and it was divided among all, with a few other dainties, in addition to the usual morsel. The shore occasionally appeared in the far-away distance. They were drifting through Baffin Bay towards the western side, so that their craft evidently did not intend to land them on any of the familiar ports of Greenland. It seemed to have an ambition to drop them nearer home. As the year was going out, and Joe's family were gnawing away at some dried sealskin, submitted to be sure, to a process Hannah called cooking, a shout was heard from him. Kayak, kayak, he cried. He had shot a seal, and it was floating away. Fortunately, the kayak was at hand, and the game was bagged. As usual, it was divided among all. The eyes were given to Charlie Polaris, and they were nice in his eyes and mouth, too. New Year's came, and Captain Tyson dined on two feet of frozen seal entrails and little seal fat. There was now nothing to burn except what little seal blubber they could spare for that purpose. 
One boat had been burned, their only sled had gone the same way, and the reckless desperate men could hardly be restrained from burning the only one now remaining, and thus cut off all good hope of final escape. To be sure, their provocation to this act was very great. The temperature was thirty-six below zero. In their strait, the desperate expedient was entertained of trying to get to land. The emaciated men would have to drag the loaded boat over the hummocky ice without a sledge. The women and children must be added to the load or abandoned. It would be a struggle for life against odds more fearful than that which now oppressed them. But what should they do? God knew. Hark! What shout is that? Kayak! Kayak! The kayak was at hand, but it had to be carried a mile. Yet it paid, for a seal shot by Joe was secured just in time to keep the men from utter desperation. To this item of comfort another was added a few days later. The sun reappeared January 19th, after an absence of eighty-three days, and remained shining upon them two hours. He brought hope to fainting hearts. Through January there was a seal taken at long intervals, but one always came just before it was too late. The men continued to grumble and deceive themselves with the idea of soon getting to Disco, where rum and tobacco were plenty. How sad that man can sink below the brute, which, however hungry, never cries out for rum and tobacco. Leaving for a moment the white men, let us look into the Eskimo huts and see how the terrible condition of things affects them. The men are almost always out hunting, but just now, as we step into Joe's snow dwelling, he is at home. The only lighter fire is that which comes from the scanty supply of seal oil. Captain Tyson is trying to write with a pencil in his journal, but he appears cold in his scanty covering of furs and looks weak and hungry. Joe and Hannah are striving to pass away the weary hours by playing checkers on an old piece of canvas, which the captain has marked into squares with his pencil. They are using buttons for men, and seem quite interested in the game. Little Puny is sitting by, wrapped in a musk-ox skin, uttering at intervals a low, plaintive cry for food. It is the most cheerful home on board the flow, but surely it is cheerless enough. We shall not wish to tarry long in the hut of Hans, for besides the unavoidable misery of the place, Mr. and Mrs. Hans are noted for the borders they keep about their persons. Under the most favorable circumstances, they regard bathing as one of the barbarous customs of civilization. The reader will recollect that the first experience Mrs. Hans had of a personal cleansing was on board Dr. Hay's vessel, and she then thought it a joke imposed by the white people's religion, too grievous to be borne. On another exploring vessel she and her husband were cruelly required to put off their long-worn garments, wash and put on clean ones, and put the old in a strong pickle, for an obvious reason. It is not certainly known that they were ever washed at any other times. Mrs. Hans' hut is not in the most tidy order, but the circumstances must be taken into the account, and also the fact of the sad neglect of her early domestic education. We have just drifted from her native land, or rather ice, where she was married in Dr. Kane's time, it being a runaway match at least on the part of the husband. Well, here they are, father, mother, and four children, on a voyage unparalleled in the history of navigation. Mr. and Mrs. Hans do not play any household games. They do not know what to do at home except to eat and feed the children, and make and mend skin clothing. We know full well to what sad disadvantage the eating is subjected at the time of our call, and we are authorized to say, to the credit of Mrs. Hans, that as to the making and mending, she has been of real service to the men on this voyage. The children of Hans cannot fail to attract our attention and sympathy. Augustina, the firstborn, 
usually fat and rugged if not ruddy, is thin and pale now, and sits chewing a bit of dried sealskin, or something of the sort, and trying to get from it a drop of nourishment. Her brother, Tobias, has thrown his head into her lap as she sits on the ground. The poor little fellow has been sick, unable to eat even the small allowance of meat given him, and has lived, one hardly knows how, on a little dry bread. Suki, the four-year-old girl, squats on the ground, that is, the canvas-covered ice floor, hugging her fur skin about her, and in a low, moaning tone repeats, I is so hungry. Her mother is trying to pick from the lamp, for the children, a few bits of tried-out scraps of blubber. Little Charlie's head is just discernible in the fur hood which hangs from the mother's neck at her back. If he gets enough to eat, which we fear is not the case, he is sweetly ignorant of the perils of this, his first trip, in the voyage of life. We shall not want to stay longer in this sad place. February was a dreadful month on board the floe. The huts were buried under the snow. It was with difficulty that Joe and Hans, almost the entire dependence of the party, could go abroad for game, and when they did, they secured a few seals only, very small, and now and then a doveki, a wee bit of a pensive seabird. Norval, the sea unicorn, were shot in several instances, but they sunk in every case and were lost. Hunger and fear seemed to possess the men in the large tent, and Joe and Hannah began to be again terrified by the thought that these hunger-mad men would kill and eat them. Now, will not God appear to help those in so helpless a condition? Yes, his hand has ever been wonderfully apparent in all Arctic perils. On the 2nd of March, just when the dark cloud of these drifting sufferers was never darker, it parted, and a flood of light burst upon their camp. Jo shot an ugyok, belonging to the largest species of seal. He was secured and dragged by all hands to the huts. He measured nine feet, weighed about seven hundred pounds, and contained, by estimation, thirty gallons of oil. There was a shout of seal in the camp. The warm blood was relished like new milk and drank freely. All eat and slept, and woke to eat again, and hunger departed for the time from the miserable huts it had so long haunted. Joe and Hannah dismissed their horrid visions of cannibalism. God was the helper of these hungry ones, and they were helped. End of chapter 44「Chapter 45 of Norse Pole Voyages by Zaharia A. Mudge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 45 The Wonderful Escape Our voyagers needed all the strength and courage which the timely capture of the great seal had given them. They had drifted into a warmer sea, and windy march was well upon them. Their flow began to herald its fast-approaching dissolution. The weary and anxious drifters were startled by day, and awakened suddenly by night, by a rumbling, mingled with fearful grindings and crashes underneath them. Heavy ice cakes, overrode by the heavier flow, ground along its under surface, and, when finding an opening of thin ice, rushed with a thundering sound to the upper surface. The din was at times so great that it seemed to combine all alarming sounds. Through all its scale the horrid discord ran, now mocked the beast, now took the groan of man. On the eleventh a storm commenced. Whole fleets of icebergs, having broken away from the icy bands in which the flow had held them, hovered round to charge upon the helpless campers. The vast area of ice on which they had been riding for so many months was lifted in places by mighty seas beneath, causing it to crack with a succession of loud reports and dismal sounds, some of which seemed to be directly under them. The wind drove before it a dense cloud of snow, so that one could scarcely see a yard. 
Night came with a darkness that could be felt. The icy foundation of their camp might separate at any moment and tumble their huts about their ears or plunge them into the sea. They gathered their few treasures together and stood ready to fly. But where? Death seemed to guard every avenue of escape. Suddenly, soon after the night set in, the disruption came. Their flow was shattered with a fearful uproar into hundreds of pieces, and they went surging off among the fragments on a piece less than a hundred yards square. They were within twenty yards of its edge, but God had kindly forbid the separation to run through their camp and sever them from their boat or from each other. After raging sixty hours, the storm abated, and their little ice ship drifted rapidly in the pack. A goodly number of seals were shot, and they began to breathe more freely. After a short time another ukyuk was captured, so food was plenty. March wore away, seals were plenty and readily taken, and though the bergs ground together and made fierce onsets into the pack, our ice ship held gallantly on her way. One night the inmates of Joe's hut were about retiring, when a noise was heard outside. What is it, Joe? Is the ice breaking up? Joe does not stop to answer but rushes out. But in ten seconds he comes back in a greater hurry, pale and breathless. There's a bear close to my kayak, he exclaims in an excited tone. Now the situation was this. The kayak was within ten paces of the entrance to the hut, and the loaded guns, which can never be kept in an Eskimo hut on account of the moisture, were in and leaning against the kayak. If the bear should take a notion to put his nose at the hut door, and liking the odor knock down the snow wall with his strong paw, and commence a supper on one of its inmates, what was to hinder him? But bears, like many young people, often failed to improve their golden opportunities. He found some seal fat and skins in the kayak, and these he pulled out, and walked off with them a rod or two to enjoy the feast. Joe crept out of the hut and ran to alarm the men. Captain Tyson followed, slipped softly up to the kayak and seized his gun. But in taking it he knocked down another one and alarmed the bear, who looked up and growled his objections to having his supper disturbed. Tyson leveled his rifle, snapped it, but it missed fire. He tried a second and third time, and it did not go. But he did, for his bearship was taking the offensive. Content to see his enemy flee, the bear returned to his supper. How many foolish bears have we seen on our explorations lose their lives by an untimely eating, but some men, more foolish, lose more than life by drinking. The captain returned to the field with a new charge in his gun. This time it sent a ball through the bear. The ball entering the left shoulder and passing through the heart came out at the other side. He staggered, but before he fell, Joe had sent another ball into his vitals. He dropped dead instantly. This affair occurred when it was too dark to see many yards, and was much pleasanter in its results than its duration. The seal hunting was successful, and with bear meat and blubber, a full store, there was no hunger unappeased, but the wind blew a gale, and the sailless, rudderless, oarless little ice ship, now banging against the berg, and now in danger of being run down by one, all the while growing alarmingly smaller, finally shot out into the open sea away from the floe. This would not do. So feeling that they might soon be dropped into the sea, they loaded the boat with such things as was strictly necessary, and all hands getting aboard sailed away. A part of their ammunition, their fresh meat, a full month's supply, and many other desirable things were abandoned. The boat, only intended to carry eight persons, was so overloaded with its twenty, including children, that it was in danger of being swamped at any moment. The frightened children cried, and the men looked sober. They sailed about twenty miles west, and landed on the first tolerably safe piece of ice which they met. Hans and family nestled down in the boat, and the rest, 
spreading on the floe what skins they had, set up a tent, and all, after eating a dry supper of bread and pemmican, lay down to rest. Thus, boating by day and camping on the ice at night for several days, they drew up on the 4th of April upon a solid-looking floe. Snow huts were built, seals were taken, and hope revived. But what is hope resting on Arctic promises? The gale was abroad again, the sea boisterous, and their flow was thrown into a panic. Fearful noises were heard beneath and around them, and their icy foundations quaked with fear. Joe's snow hut was shaken down. He built it again, and then Lot and House fell off into the sea and disappeared. Thus warned, the camp was pushed farther back from the water. But they did not know where the crack and separation would next come. Thus they lived in anxious watching through weary days. The gale unabated. Finally, one night, the feared separation came. All hands except Mr. Myers were in the tent, near them, so near a man could scarcely walk between, was the boat, containing Myers and the kayak, but with mischievous intent, the crack ran so as to send the boat drifting among the breaking and overlapping ice. Mr. Myers could not manage it, of course, under such circumstances, and the kayak was of no use to any but an Eskimo, so he set it afloat, hoping it would drift to the flow party. Here was a fearful situation. The flow party, as well as Mr. Myers, was sure to perish miserably if the boat was not returned. There was only a dim light, and objects at a short distance looked hazy. It was a time for instant and desperate action. Joe and Hans took their paddles and ice spears and started for the boat, jumping from one piece of floating slippery ice to another. They were watched in breathless suspense, until they seemed in the shadowy distance to have reached the boat, and then all was shut out in the darkness. The morning came, and the flow party were glad to see that the boat had three men in it. It was a half mile off, and the kayak was as far away in another direction. It was soon clear that the boat could not be brought back without a stronger force. Tyson led the way, and finally all but two of the men made the desperate passage of the floating ice to the imperiled craft. It was with difficulty that, with their combined force, the boat was returned to the flow. The kayak was also recovered. For a brief time there was quiet all round. The aurora gleamed and displayed its wonderful beauty of form and motion, while the majestic icebergs in every varied shape reflected its sparkling light. The grandeur of sea and sky seemed a mockery to the danger beset voyagers. The elements might be grand, but they had combined to destroy them, for a new form of peril now appeared. The sea came aboard of their icy craft. They were sitting one evening under their frail tent, the boat near, when a wave swept over their flow, carrying away tent, clothing, provisions, everything except what was on their persons or in the boat. The women and children had been put on board, in fear of such an occurrence, and the men had just time to save themselves by clinging to the gunwale. The boat itself was borne into the middle of the flow. When the wave subsided, the boat was dragged back, lest another push by a succeeding one might launch it into the sea from the other side. It was well they did this, for another wave bore it to the opposite edge and partly slipped it into the water. This game of surging the boat from one side to the other of the flow was kept up from nine o'clock in the evening to seven in the morning. All this time the men were in the water, fighting the desperate battle for its safety, and the preservation of their own lives, the conflict being made more terrible by the fact that every wave bore with it ice blocks from a foot square to those measuring many yards, having sharp edges and jagged corners, with which it battered their legs until they were black and blue. It was the severest test of their courage and endurance yet experienced. But God was their helper. Not one perished, and when the defeated sea was by his voice commanded to retire, 
and the day appeared, they were not seriously harmed. But they were cold and wet, without a change of clothes, and utterly provisionless. It is not surprising that after their rough handling on the floe, they should seek a larger and safer one. This they did, launching their crowded boat into the turbulent sea, and working carefully along, succeeded in landing safely on one stronger looking. Nothing worse happening than the tumbling overboard of the cook, who was quickly rescued. Here, cold, half-drowned, hungry, and weary to faintness, they tried to dry and warm themselves in the feeble rays of the sun, and wait for their food at the hand of the great provider, in the use of such means as were yet left to them. They had preserved their guns and a small supply of powder and shot. Snow and rain came on, and continued until noon of the next day, April 22nd. Their hunger was fearful. Mr. Myers had been slightly frostbitten when drifting away alone in the boat. His health seemed broken, and he was actually starving. In the afternoon of this day, Joe went as usual with his gun. He had caught nothing on this floe, and now there were no signs of seals, though it was his fourth time out that day. What should they do? God had their relief all arranged. Joe saw what he did not expect to see, and what was seldom seen so far south, a bear. He ran back to the boat, called Hans with his trusty rifle, and the two lay down behind the hammocks. All were ordered to lie down, keep perfectly quiet, and feign themselves seals, the Eskimo helping out the deception by imitating the seal bark. Bruin came on cautiously. He too was hungry. What are those black objects, and what is that noise, he seemed to say? They don't look quite like seals. The noise is not just like the seal cry. But hunger is a weighty reason with men and bears, on the side of what they desire to believe. So the bear came on. When fairly within an easy range, both rifles cracked, and he fell dead. The whole party arose with a shout. Polar was dragged to the boat and skinned. His warm blood slaked their raging thirst. His meat, tender and good, satisfied their gnawing hunger. They were saved from a terrible death. Seals were secured soon after, and hope again revived. It was not long before their ice craft crumbled away, so they were obliged to repeat the experiment, always full of danger, of launching into the sea and making for a larger and safer one. April 28th, they were beset by a fleet of bergs, which were crashing against each other with a thundering noise, and occasionally turning a threatening look towards the fail craft of our drifters. So angrily at last did one come down upon them, that they abandoned their flow and rode away. Surely there is no peace for them by night or day, on the flow or afloat in their boat. They dare not lie down a moment without keeping one half of their number on the watch. But what is that in the distance? A steamer! A thrill of joy goes through the boat's company. Every possible signal is given, but she does not see them, and another night is spent on the floe. The next morning every eye was straining to see a whaler. Soon one appears. They shout, raise their signals, and fire every gun at once. But she passes out of sight. April 30th, as the night was setting in foggy and dark, the shout from the watch of steamer brought all to their feet. She was right upon them in the fog before she was seen. Hans was soon alongside of her in his kayak, telling their story as best he could. In a few moments the whaler was alongside of their piece of ice. Captain Tyson removed his old, well-worn cap, called upon his men, and three cheers were given ending with a tiger, such as the poor fellows had not had a heart to give for many long months. The cheers were returned by a hundred men from the rigging and deck of the vessel. It was the sealer Tigress, Captain Bartlett, of Conception Bay, Newfoundland. They soon had the planks of a good ship beneath them, instead of a treacherous flow. Curious but kind friends beset them, instead of threatening bergs, 
and every comfort succeeded to utter destitution. They had been on the flow six months and floated more than sixteen hundred miles. They were speedily conveyed by the way of Conception Bay and St. John's to their own homes, the telegraph having flashed throughout the length and breadth of the land their coming, and the nation rejoiced. But there were tears mingled with the joy that one, the noble, the true, the Christian commander of the expedition, Charles Francis Hall, lay in his icy grave in the far north. As speedily as possible the Tigress was purchased and fitted out by the United States government in search of the Polaris party. Captain Tyson and Joe were among her men. She reached Lifeboat Co. about two months after Captain Buddington and his men had left. They learned that much to the grief of the natives, the Polaris had floated off and sunk. The Buddington party arrived home in the fall by the way of England. As we may not meet our Eskimo friends again, with whom we have made so many voyages, the reader will want to know the last news from them. Hans and his family returned to Greenland in the Tigress. Joe has bought a piece of land and a house near New London, Connecticut, and intends, with his family, to remain there, getting a living by fishing. Thus ended the last American North Pole expedition. The last from other governments have not been more successful. Yet while we write, England and Austria are reported as getting ready further North Polar expeditions to start in the spring of 1875. It must be allowed that the icy scepter guardian of the North has made a good fight against the invaders into his dominions. But the nations of the earth are determined to send men to sit on his throne, though they find it a barren and worthless, as well as a cold domain. The End End of chapter 45 This is also the end of North Pole Voyages by Zahari A. Mudge Recorded by Christine in Riga, Latvia, February 29, 2020